Zanina. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm calling to order the Orleans Parish School Board Committee of the whole meeting for November 15th, 2022. The time is now 1.05 p.m. May I have a roll call, please? Mr. Parker. Present. Mr. Ashley. Present. Dr. Batiste. Present. Ms. Bodwin. Present. Ms. Eames. Mr. Marshall. Present. Mr. Zervagon. Present. Also present, Dr. Avis Williams, Superintendent, Ms. Ashley Halpern, Board Council, you have a quorum. Thank you so much. Interpretation services are available during today's meeting, and so with that, I yield to our interpreters. Thank you, President Parker. Good afternoon, board members. Good afternoon, Dr. Williams, Superintendent. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Viet Quinn. I will provide inter interpretation in Vietnamese. Xin chào toàn thể quý vị. Tôi tên là Viet. Tôi là thông dịch viên. Tôi sẽ thông dịch cho quý vị trong buổi họp này. Nếu quý vị cần, xin cho tôi biết. Xin chân thành cảm ơn. Good afternoon, board, mem board members. Good afternoon, Dr. Williams. My name is Lina Martinez. I will be providing interpretation services for you in Spanish today. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Lina Martinez. Yo voy a estar interpretando para cualquier persona que necesite ayuda esta tarde. Gracias. Thank you. We're now moving on to item 1.2. So I ask everybody to please rise and join us in stating the pledge. Okay, now moving on to item 1.3, I will defer to our board council to take us through the rules for public comment. Thank you, President Parker. Anyone wishing to speak with regard to items on the agenda should fill out a public comment card. Cards will be received up to one half hour after the meeting begins. Each person shall be permitted to speak up to two minutes as established by the chair. I will recognize the speaker and give the speaker permission to proceed. The speaker shall state their name and address for the board record. Those who have a group concern are encouraged to select a spokesperson from the group to address the concern. Speakers are expected to be as concise as possible and to present their questions and comments in an objective manner and in accordance with good taste and decorum and without reference to or insinuations against the board, its members, or school system employees. Disruptions or disorderly conduct at the business meeting will constitute grounds for the presiding officer to ask security personnel to remove the offender. Thank you, President Parker. Thank you so much. Moving to item 1.4, adoption of the agenda. Do we have any additions, deletions, or modifications? Seeing no. none. Uh, may I have a motion to approve the agenda as presented? So move. Is there a second? Second. Moved by Mr. Ashley and seconded by Dr. Batiste. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, the agenda is adopted. Before we move on to item 2.1, I just want to take a quick point of personal privilege and recognize that this week is uh, the 62nd anniversary of Ruby Bridges integrating uh, New Orleans Public Schools at William France Elementary. Um, and I just wanted to remind everybody that this is not a, um, this is not ancient history. Ruby Bridges is very much still among us. I have had the pleasure of meeting her multiple times, as I know many board members have. And there are still many people who opposed her integration who are out there amongst us today, living and voting and working alongside us. So, um, you know, we've come a long way as a school system, and I hope that, uh, I just want to congratulate uh, Ruby Bridges and, and uh, the McDonough Three as well for their bravery uh, 62 years ago. That is all. Moving on to item 2.1, I will defer to our board council. It is recommended that the Orleans Parish School Board adopt the minutes of the October 18th, 2022 Committee of the Whole Meeting. We have a motion to adopt the minutes as presented. So move, wave in the reading of the minutes. Second. It's been moved by Mr. Ashley and seconded by Mr. Marshall. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, the minutes have been adopted. Okay. Moving on to item 3.1, our Accountability and Charters Committee. I welcome uh, Ms. Leela Eames, the representative for District 1, to facilitate our Accountability and Charters section. Good afternoon, uh, President Parker and board members. I'd like to take a moment of personal privilege as well, and I would like to thank 
the, my uh, constituents in the, I'm going to call it the uh, lower New Orleans East and the lower Ninth Ward for <laughs> uh, selecting me or electing me as the District 1 board member. It's a privilege to serve with this distinguished board, and it's a privilege to represent my community, my families, and my children, and I promise to do the very best that I possibly can to represent you. Thank you. President Parker. And thank you, fellow board members, for your support. Now, we will have Dr. Kelly Jordan take us through the month schools update. Dr. Jordan. Thank you, Mrs. Eames. Good afternoon, President Parker, members of the board, and Dr. Williams. Excited to bring you the November schools update today. There we go. This month for our school highlights, you will see we had a great, great Halloween celebration here at NOLA PS with some of our scholars visiting to trick or treat. And we really enjoyed having a bunch of kids around uh, getting nice candy from all of our staff members. October was also Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And I wanted to highlight um, the student council at John F. Kennedy who sponsored Aware Pink Day and ultimately donated um, the funds for participation to a local charity that supports breast cancer awareness. So thank you to the student council members at John F. Kennedy. We also have Berman Scholars celebrating breast cancer awareness. Um, and also the class of 2023, Senior Night is present at a lot of our football games. So gearing up for graduation this spring. And then last but not least, um, the month of October was Youth Justice Awareness Month. And Travis Hill School hosted its sixth annual Arts and Advocacy Night in order to share the talents of students within the community. And the theme for this year was Justice is for Yourself. And I know they had a great turnout um, and a lot of engagement at that event. And so along the lines of Youth Justice Awareness Month, for Juvenile Justice Awareness Week specifically, the update I wanted to share with you all this month was a Lunch and Learn that was co-hosted by our NOLA PS School Support and Improvement Team alongside Travis Hill staff and an opportunity to participate. And it was really, really meaningful. Some of the students at Travis Hill led a community building circle shared some really, really impactful messaging around the importance of relationship building, as well as the importance of offering a variety of after-school activities beyond sports for them to engage. And one of the questions that they were posed by participants in this community circle was, what do you think some of our schools could have done in order to prevent you from um, being within the juvenile justice system? And that was an um, impactful response that I really wanted to elevate here today. We also um, received a presentation on trauma-informed strategies that they're implementing at Travis Hill that schools could take back um, to support the social emotional needs of our scholars. And then last but not least, um, participants were able to receive a guided tour of Travis Hill School and just see some of the day-to-day -day instruction and students that were engaged in technology-based instruction, arts, arts instruction, um, and music. And so overall, I think it was an extremely impactful um, day for those who were those who participated, we had school leaders as well as a variety of school staff members. I wanted to um, thank the school support team, Dr. Jeremy Brooks, Cecily White, and Dr. Robertson, as well as Byron Goodwin at Travis Hill, the Travis Hill staff, for coordinating with us this really, really meaningful um, event and helping us elevate the voices of our young people at Travis Hill. For the next part of our school's update this month, I'm going to have uh, Mrs. Mary Garten come up to share more information about our enrollment system. Good afternoon, everyone. It is nice to see you all. Um, so I'm coming to you today with a couple of things. First of all, we'll talk through just some updates about what, what is happening now. We are in the middle of main round, and I want to talk a little bit about what's happening there and also give some reminder, take advantage of this opportunity to give some reminders to the community related to enrollment. And then for the second half of this presentation, I'm gonna talk about 10-1 target setting, what, the, what we see in enrollment projections and how our current projections are built on those two considerations together, 10-1 target setting 
and other studies. So without further ado, I will dive in. So on November 7th, we launched our main round application, and to date we have over 3,000 applications received. Last year we received approximately 10,000 applications during this window. The current plan is that that window will close on January 20th, 2023. In February, we will la launch the early childhood main round application, and then following that, we will transition into open enrollment. And while that date is not yet final, we anticipate that that opening will be late spring. I do wanna take this moment in talking through the details of our annual process to just make you all aware of, of two, actually three groups currently involved in advising on enrollment work. So we meet regularly with an enrollment advisory group, which consists of one representative from each charter management organization, in addition to type twos and some of our community partners, where we talk strategy, policy, and overall development. We have a second group, which is our enrollment point of contact monthly meetings. And instead of one per organization, that is one per school. And that's where we talk about all of the concrete mechanics and the close partnership work that happens across the administration in schools during this busy enrollment season, although the groups meet all year. The third group, not on your slide, but one I'll mention uh, with enthusiasm and share more about later, is that uh, last night we launched our superintendent solution circle for enrollment. So more to come on that forthcoming, but we had a great meeting with parents, uh, board chairs from charter schools and other advocates for uh, uh, Reverend, Reverend Calhoun. We had a bunch of folks. It was great. More to come on reporting the work of that group. The, um, I do want to, so now into the important reminders. I want to talk a little bit about who should apply and who should not apply and who should complete an NCAP, the New Orleans Common Application Process. The people who should apply are new students, including kindergartners, Students who are in the last grade offered by their school. So if you're an eighth grader, an eighth grader is the last grade you need to apply. Students who want to switch schools or students who want a new school next year who are either new to the parish or would be new to public school. Just as important is our students who should not apply. If students are happy with their current school, they should not, and that school has their grade that they're going to be in next year, they should not apply. They will be automatically enrolled. Um, the other people who should not apply are students who need a school this year. That is a separate process for those students who are eligible. So any questions about any of that so far? Uh, just some other reminders to take advantage of while we're here today is families should not apply for seats that they don't want more than the seats they have. So that unfortunately that does happen annually as we'll have a, a number of families apply for other seats, get those seats, and then wish they had stayed where they were and just want to make folks aware that a submitted application that is left there when the main round window closes will, if possible, mean a match. And that does mean students lose the seat that they left. That doesn't mean parents can't withdraw applications. If you apply and want to take it back, you can. If you apply and change your mind, you can apply over and over again. Only the last one that families submit will count. Uh, families can pick up to 12 schools. Um, and, and again, just want to reiterate that applicants can cancel applications at any point along the way if they need to, or replace them with a new one. Uh, when, once we get through the application window, the application process, we move into the match process. As I think, no, as I think most folks know well, but I'll just restate, the match process assigns all students to their single best option based on the set of information and using priorities that align with individual charter school operating agreements. The, the main point that I wanna get across today, in addition to just the details about how to go about doing this, is that main round is the single best option for a family to get the seat they want. So getting every family that wants or needs a new seat to apply during this window is the best thing that we can do to advance equity and get our families into the schools that they are most interested in attending, so. A few just places folks can go for information or support are, um, of course, we have our website. We have an Explore Schools tool with information by school program, information here on where to apply. And of course, we also have our three family resource centers available across the city at Gaudet, at Mahalia Jackson, and here, where we can provide in-person assistance uh, and language services as needed. So any questions about any of that? 
Uh, board member Ashley? Mm -hmm. <laughs> a quick question. Yep. So I, I got a, an inquiry about whether or not some of our, our newer schools that have entered into our, our, our in-cap process, yep. uh, I think they were in the past allowed to keep like a waiting list uh, of sorts. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, I have no idea if, if our process even allows for that to yep. happen or exist. So just give, give a sense of, is that a thing? That, that is yeah. a thing. Please. So board policy still permits waiting lists for schools with admissions, with academic admissions criteria. So those wait lists do exist and we maintain them. Yeah, we maintain them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Ms. Garden, I have a few questions as well. These okay. are also related to questions that have come to me from constituents. Yep. Um, I often hear from folks that you have to list 12 schools on your application. I okay. know that that I know that that is yep. not the case. I also know that it's a good idea to list more than one school. Yep. Uh, can you talk about that phenomenon, like the number of schools that you should list and why that matters? Yep, absolutely. So let me get my exact number right. Um, So for the past two years, the percentage of applicants who seek a new placement that received one of their top three choices was 82%. So if families can pick at least three choices, we found that 82% of those families have been able to get one of those three schools. Um, what, what we found to be true sometimes is families have their eye on one school or maybe two schools. One or two is very different than three statistically in terms of our ability to ma make a seat happen for families. So I will say that we certainly encourage folks to put as many schools as they would like, but schools that they would attend, schools that they would want to go to. It is harder on our system. Well, it's, it's solvable, but if families apply to seats they don't want, it sometimes means they lose a seat they would have rather had or other circumstances. So any school that a family would like to go to, um, if they're in an entry grade at a new school or, in the, or more than the seat that they're in, if they're in a school where they can return, is worth putting on that list. So the, the more the better. And I will say we do target communications throughout the main round process. So we are constantly assessing our applicant pool and communicating with them. Anyone who applies to us and submits just one school, for example, will hear from us frequently, encourage them, encouraging them to consider adding additional schools. So. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. The, the other question I have heard a couple of times now is individuals who are moving to Orleans Parish for next school year but mm -hmm. do not yet reside here, yep. what is the process for those applicants? They can, apply, they can apply now. There is no reason to wait. They can apply now. And as a matter of fact, they should apply now for all the same reasons. Main round is better. Having said that, they will be required to provide proof of residency once they are registering at the school site. Like we do some of that with families and can assist, but the final proof of residency and that verification happens at the school. So at that point, if they're unable to provide that documentation, they would lose their seat. But that doesn't happen um, until closer to the start of the school year. Got it. And that is the case for, <clears throat> excuse me, that's the case for our selective admission schools as well. If they need to take a language proficiency test or if they need to take a, uh, an admissions test, mm -hmm. they still need to take that test, but they don't have to pr provide their residency Correct. in order to take that. Okay. They have time. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's helpful. Board members, anything else for Ms. Garden? Mr. Marshall. Mm -hmm. uh, what about a mid-year uh, applicant? Mm -hmm. Well, one thing that we pay close attention to is how many programs are available per grade level for families who are coming in now. So if you moved here tomorrow and needed a new school on Thursday, we could help you. So we ensure that we have at least five traditional program options at each grade level. And by that I mean we consider, of course, a school with a language requirement or even some schools with really specific program priorities. Um, we don't count those in the five. Uh, but we do make those options available. So a student who would come here tomorrow would have at least five options for K-8 and at least five options for 9-12 across the city. If that ever wasn't the case, we have a system in place with our schools where they, through a process we, where, where we rotate one school at a time, they would be asked to make additional seats available to families. So we'll never go less than five. Yep. Thank you. Dr. Batiste? Thank you. Ms. Garden, and mm -hmm. this is just a point of clarification yep. for myself. Uh, for families, uh, and I'm bringing myself back to when I was a uh -huh. part of the district, 
for the transitory nature of the school district yeah. for students who have applied and gotten the school that they wish yeah. or may not have gotten the school that they wish if they move into another area what impact does the incap have on the placement and the situation of those students for the remainder of the school year are you talking about a mid-year change any time during the year yeah it happened sometimes it was 30 days i understand you know? well if that applicant would like to change their application after main round closes, they would have the opportunity to seek a new seat during the summer, during open enrollment. And up until October 1st, it's pretty flexible. If seats are available and a family is eligible, they can, um, they can take those seats, even if it means moving out of another NOLA public school seat. Uh, after October 1st, we enter into a process called the hardship transfer window. We actually have a full-time staff person, and if, if you saw the volume, you would understand that she may even need help, right? There's a lot of requests because life changes, circumstances change, and we have a set of circumstances that we vet regularly with our advisory groups um, that make students eligible to transfer during the school year. And those, you know, and sometimes that can be my mother's job changed and she can't get me to the school where I was attending. So, um, and then those students would have access to the list I described to Mr. Marshall to transfer schools. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other yeah. questions, board members? Well, I certainly hope this process is making it easier for families in our city because we were getting a lot of complaints with the old system. So how, um, how are you handling the situations uh, when parents complain about this system? I think, well, we take everything seriously. Like even the questions that you've brought forth today, I'm like noting to myself and my team is watching as well to like, are we clear enough? Like, is there more that we could do to encourage folks to apply to three or more schools? Um, are there ways that we can make sure for families understand that they have options if their circumstances change during the year? I will say, and I'll lean on my brand new solution circle that just met last night. Um, they were pleasantly surprised by some of the statistics. They actually thought the match rates were higher. They're like, why are we here? And then they answered their own question. They're like, a lot of it has to do with communications and engaging with families individually so that they understand their circumstance and get the information that they need. We do have 10 full-time employees who work in our in our family resource centers who help families. We prioritize meeting needs individually as they come forward. We aim to add three full-time people, one at each of the three centers, funded in large part by the early childhood millage. All three will be bilingual to expand the number of, of Spanish-speaking staff available to help families enroll. So we take everyone very seriously. We got one question from a board chair last night that I I hesitated on answering and my, my team sort of like went down the weeds on that this morning trying to make sure that we could handle that situation when it came up. So we, we operate in a way that is both very big and very small at the same time. Like we think about systems, we think about talking to individual families and giving them the information they need, but at the same time, you know, communicating with every student who falls into that set of circumstances. So I, we want to always do better, Masim. So please, please do let us know when you hear from folks who have concerns, direct them to those, uh, the resources that are available or direct them to our team. So thank you. You're welcome. Okay. All right. So as I mentioned when I started, before we talk about sort of what we see as some of the enrollment projections for the system moving forward and revisit some of the New Schools for New Orleans enrollment study work, I do want to talk about the 10-1 match process. It is a core element of enrollment planning for the district and a core element of enrollment planning for schools. Um, it's the way schools build their budgets. There are fixed costs that don't change if a classroom isn't filled to capacity, so schools are thoughtful about how many children they need to have to run their program effectively. Um, I do want to say, and this question came up at last, last month's board meeting, I heard, the, um, the main round match targets and the 10-1 target setting are, are largely driven by schools, and I want to explain how and why that happens that way. Um, great. So we, we work with schools and we provide, on, the, on behalf of the data and enrollment team, we provide them with a significant amount of information. We let them know how many new students they had last year, what their number of people who were assigned to their school in main round was, what that meant the number of students they had enrolled on 10-1, 
as we talked about earlier, like family circumstances change a lot. So a school does not set an October 1st match target one to one. Every student, every, excuse me, every school experiences some level of attrition. So one of the most important processes that we undergo as an administration is working school by school to set the number of students that they hope to have on October 1st so that they can effectively run their school programs. And we backwards plan from that based on real data and work with them to set a match target for this first main round. So we seek to fill to that point based on attrition in the past, and then we also work with some of those schools to set a number for the summer as well, like how many students they're trying to enroll during the summer. So it's it's different school by school. We look, we look at the last five plus years to understand trends over time. Schools that historically fill entirely are going to have less attrition than other schools. We've seen this statistically. But at the same time, we know that a very, um, a very sought after elementary school, for example, if they get a couple of open seats in the summer because kids move or circumstances change, which will happen, it creates, you know, it can create a large amount of attention on those two seats. A lot of families will want those seats and try to get those two seats. So it's, we work with all schools to set reasonable targets based on some attrition, based on five plus years of real data. They can build their budgets around that. We can, and we can do all of our projections across the system. We talk constantly about where 10-1 is. Once 10-1 hits, that's how schools are funded. That's when students cannot change their school enrollment as easily. And it is, again, as I said when I started, just one of the most important pieces of how we work with schools. Now, board policy actually does give the superintendent and the administration pretty broad authority on working with schools to set those enrollment targets. That is. We have addressed that historically, and we are addressing it again this year in close partnership with schools. So schools tell us what they think they would like to have in terms of their target, and we work with them on what's realistic in terms of getting to that point. We all know, and I'll talk in short order about overall enrollment project, projected enrollment declines. So towards that end, we aren't, schools are not allowed to add numbers to their 10-1 targets without individual meetings with me and my team to talk through why they might do that. We don't wanna put forth a position of no new seats, no one's 10-1 targets can get bigger because that isn't always in the best interest of the system. If a school where families really wanna go moves to a building that's a little bit bigger and can accommodate a few more students or something else can happen, we wanna take that into consideration with an eye on the needs of the system as a whole. Um, certainly an example of that where the administrative administration responded supportively was Warren Easton expansion of its ninth grade program. Um, you know, putting, putting in place an across the board moratorium on new seats for 10-1 targets has not been our administrative position as a way to move forward with district optimization. So instead, we work in close partnership with schools and make them aware of information related to what they can expect and what we expect system-wide in terms of enrollment. Any questions about that? This is Sir no, this is a really great report. And you know, in the early days of the common enrollment, the projection targets and confusion about them, and then schools maybe having an under enrollment and all, it, it, was, it was very difficult. So mm -hmm. I'm very glad to hear about the collaboration mm -hmm. between the, uh, the, the central enrollment authority, you know, the central office and the schools, especially um, considering that this is one of the absolute most important things yep. that the central office must do. Yep understanding capacity, understanding enrollment projections and financial projections and helping the schools plan accordingly, mm -hmm. understanding that the schools at the school level, at the site, have a pretty good idea what's going on. Yep. But they got to understand the system too. So this is um, wonderful to hear about where we've landed, the work that you're doing with the solution circles and so forth, yep. uh, especially as we go towards some difficult questions. So just a big, big thank you for all the work that's gone on in the last several years to really get this going so well. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? 
Thank you very much for a very thorough report. All right. We actually have a whole other section missing. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, I promise to move quickly. I know I'm taking quite a bit of time, but I do appreciate the opportunity to share those announcements with all of you in the public. So I do want to let you know our current, our active student count for this school year is not down from last year. It's very similar, but this number is not final. We anticipate that it will be final by the end of Certainly, I would, I'd say winter, likely the end of this calendar as we work with the state to reconcile that. While we do see the same enrollment trends overall, we do think some of this is related to moderate elevation in numbers from last year on 10-1 due to IDA and other factors, but we're continuing to follow that closely and we'll keep you posted. As we look at historic enrollment trends for K-12 and kindergarten, and, and this of course is sourced from the New Schools for New Orleans enrollment landscape analysis, just want to say that we, we do continue to see an overall decline in K-12, most notably in kindergarten, or one of the most notable things being in kindergarten. So we, of course, share this with schools regularly in the context of 10-1 target setting and other enrollment work, and we'll continue to do so. In terms of the overall enrollment projection estimates for all grades, um, this, in the range that, this is using the New Schools for New Orleans en enrollment landscape analysis, looking at low, middle, and high projections between now and 2026, 2027, we predict anything from a 1,300 to a 4,200 fewer students by 2026, 27. We have broken that out by grade band. They're pretty um, consistent across K4 and 5, 8, 9, 12, we don't see the same near-term declines, but the declines over time are expected to be comparable. This is in part to a, in large part to a, um, we have a bump in our enrollment around middle school right now, and as those children make their way through high school, that will impact overall enrollment. Uh, this next slide is a big one, but part of the reason I wanted to spend so much time talking about 10-1 was to put this in context. Numbers schools set for their 10-1 targets are their real numbers, right? They're building their models around it, they're asking for it. They understand in individual circumstances where they may be aiming too high or whatever, like they understand those contexts well and we know them from being in close communication with them. This chart shows, given those projections from the enrollment landscape analysis, based on schools' self-assessments, the number of excess seats we would be on track to have by 2026 using this methodology of looking at school self-reported 10-1 targets and the landscape analysis. The, the reason I, I wanna call attention to our next steps, most notably, some of them coming out of some of the things that were brought up at this, in this day as last month and along the way, our next steps include hiring a demographer. We anticipate launching this work after the first of the year to look at, consider, and frankly reconsider over time enrollment projections. The second thing is incorporate, as I mentioned, the final state data for this year after it's, after it's official. Um, the next thing which is being led by the operations team is we are revisiting program capacity at all facilities. These 10-1 targets have been one way to set an enrollment projection. We would like to also do this and say, even if this school says they can take X hundred students, we know that school can actually hold Y hundred students. And so for that reason, we wanna consider that that extra number, that delta in our, in our analysis of where we have or don't have excess seats. So the, the facility program capacity is a key piece to our next step for determining uh, what, what we think the excess capacity is system-wide. We're also looking at, and this, of course, a lot of this work crosses many departments in the district, measuring and setting goals around the number of programs, the options, the choices, specialized learning environments available to families, where they are in the city, how do they connect to early childhood opportunities, all of those things matter. So district optimization isn't just fill each school and when the math works, we're done. It's considering all of these things at the same time um, and that's what we aim to do. And then as we have done, we will continue to refine enrollment guidelines with schools based on what we learn along the way. And by along the way, I do just wanna say, we mean the coming months, but frankly, the coming years. Like I think this is just the work of the district for a while now. Um, so that, that is that. Yeah, any questions? Questions? Mrs. Zervagon. I just have one. How do uh, y'all work with the operators to determine when a school, or what number would the concentrate school being quote unquote full 
and I, and I ask this because, like when I was in school and there was 78,000 students, yeah. often a school that was full was actually completely o o overfilled mm -hmm. and a detriment to, yeah. the, to the program. So how do we determine what is the, the right max for a, a school? I know that the operations team plans to t like do more work on this and talk to you about this in the coming months, but I will say it is it is a standardized process. It is a library equals zero, a classroom equals, in an elementary school equals X, a classroom in a high school equals Y, and um, it is a number. Having said that, it is not, it is a guideline. Like we have schools that consistently fill above and be above they're in their uh, program capacity, and we have schools that fill consistently below it, which is why, frankly, the operations team just wants to take some time to revisit it all and come yeah, back. It could be some interesting questions about autonomy, yeah. you know, considering mm -hmm. if they say our program is this kind of curriculum, and for us, a max yep. class is X, and yep. if you ask us to go above it, that yep. violates everything we're doing. And so this could be, it could be some interesting yeah. conversations y'all have. I look forward to seeing mm -hmm. what y'all and, and that's why it's so integrated across all the work of the mm -hmm. district, right? Because then there's the question of, if I'm running a, a program that takes more physical space in a building, but say that building has a really high facility, you know, is a really high quality facility, we want as many students in that building as possible. So obviously there's weighing program autonomy, um, autonomy weighing facility quality index, yeah. all at the same time. I'll so. look forward to seeing how y'all yeah. how y'all weigh those two. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Mr. Parker. Yes, um, just a couple of questions for you. One is, um, sorry, sorry, I didn't realize you were. I feel like I thought you were done. Friend. I just looked at my. Not wallet. done. Oh goodness. Yeah. Don't worry, they're they're not they're not hard <laughs> questions. I don't think. Um, my first question is just on the, for us it's page twenty eight, the enrollment projection estimate slide, okay. um, and and all of these slides really, it mentions system wide K twelve program, uh, projected enrollment, is huh. that. NOLA Public Schools projected enrollment, or is that all K through 12 students Important in Important clarifying Church? question. All K-12 public school students. Okay. So that includes type two charter schools okay. who do all participate in our application process. Got it. Yeah. Uh, okay, that's helpful, thank you. And then uh, I would love to know, as, as you're going through these next steps, I would love mm -hmm. to know, this is similar to Mr. Zervagon's question, like what is the ideal amount of excess capacity both at the school and at the system level. Yep. Like you, you, we have you know fifty-two thousand available seats for uh, you know forty-two-ish thousand students. Is that good? Is that bad? Like, what is the ideal number? I, I don't know, and so I would love to hear yep. more about that. Um, also, to Mr. Zervagon's point, like which buildings are underutilized, which are overutilized. Yep. Um, and then I just I think all of these next steps are great, and just look forward to hearing more updates on them. So thank you. Thanks, everyone. All right. Anyone else? Thank you. All right. I yield to board member Eames to introduce our November Schools at Work presentation. Thank you, Dr. Jordan. Uh, next, we'll have Ms. Scott, the Executive Director of Opportunities Academy. Are we ready? Great. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Sophia Scott, the Executive Director of Opportunities Academy, and I will show you a video and tell you a bit about our school. So I'll kick it off with a video so you can see what I get to experience all the time. My name is Coop. I'm a student at Opportunities Academy. I ride the bus to school in the morning. My name is Zavi Akaroi. I go to the morning. Miss Scott greets us, and we go into school and get breakfast. After breakfast, it's time for internship. My name is Henry, and I am the manager at Wells Oil Coffee Shop. The teacher and the student put, put the order in for Wells. We had to take to work right away. Coop made the ticket and passed off to Asia of Barisa. She made the train and let Aaron know it's 
you could be waiting. He delivered the order to the teacher. My job is to help the teammate I admit so they will follow all the setup and make the train correctly. At Wolves, I feel like happy because I like to help my teammate out if they need help. Hello, I am Sean and I am a student at OA. Hello, my name is Kia. We work at Soaptopia at Opportunities Academy Car Wash. Teachers can sign up to have their car wash. The most popular service is the Soaptopia Special. Our team gets divided up between a few different jobs to wash the cars quickly. The teams are soap and scrub, rinse and dry, and interiors. We have to get five or six cars washed during our internship time, so we have to work quickly. We also need to show teamwork to one another. We help each other, we help our classmates. I've learned there are different skills, and we've learned how to practice our interviews and how to dress professionally. Doing a good job at Sotopia makes me very happy. When I graduate, it's time for me to take all I learned from OA and bring it outside to the world. And that is a very small snippet. Thank you. <laughs> um, that is a very small snippet of what our students get to do in the morning from 9 a.m. until noon. Every student in our building, regardless of exceptionality, regardless of ability, has a job. Um, for some of our students, those jobs are what we call specialized, and so they cater to st students' specific needs, modal coordination, um, communication, tactile things. For some of our students, those are supported. Uh, they, we have supported crafts. We got bracelets. Um, we have supported office as well. Supported office learns to sort and other office tasks that they could have access to when they are no longer students with us. You saw Roast and Car Wash, which are two of our internships that also offers product or services. The students in those internships are pretty um, independent, as well as we have a clean team. So if you walk in in the morning, you might see students around the building cleaning up. We have a, a housekeeping internship. We have a space called the apartment. Those students learn to make beds, fold clothes, sort clothes, wash dishes, um, and uh, that. And we have Broadway. How can I forget about Broadway? Broadway is our warehouse. And so what happens in Broadway is um, internship leads or teachers or any staff member can order things they might need. It could be gloves, uh, car wash off orders, all of their supplies through Broadway. Once a week, Broadway goes to, they went this morning, they go to Sam, they order all the things, they pay for all the things, and then they go back into the building and process the orders and deliver those things. Again, skills that they're developing because it's jobs that they have access to when they leave us. Questions? Awesome. Okay. All right. Um, at Opportunities Academy, we focus a lot on employability. That's half of our day. So 9 to 12, again, all of our students are working. Uh, and we have two other areas that we focus on. We focus on teaching students how to navigate the community and how to live independently. Um, navigating the community looks like maybe students are learning something like crossing the street, stop. Look both ways, let's cross. Stop at stop signs, stop at red lights. It could also look like, let's plan a trip to Rose, or I'm sorry, to Rouse's, so that we can go and get the items we might need for culinary, and then we're gonna catch the bus to do that. Our students know how to catch the bus. I haven't had to catch the bus since 2004, so I do not know how to catch the bus. Uh, it is a valuable skill for them, given many of them don't have access to driver's licenses. Like we might, might not be the safest, might not be able to afford using an Uber or a Lyft, and so skills that are gonna take them very far. Uh, and then if we are talking independent living, we are teaching students hygiene. So you might walk into a space and students are brushing their teeth, washing their face. Um, independent look, living also looks like the culinary lessons. And so while we are not yet equipped to teach students to cook on a stove, we teach them how to make meals in microwaves. Uh, they like to make this uh, 
cupcake mug cupcake. It was really good. Uh, they learned how to make salads and sandwiches and other like fancy ramen dishes in the microwave because again, things that they can do independently when they are no longer with us and right now at home. And so we try to make sure we communicate with families about those things, send them pictures, all of those things. So families also know the skills that their students are developing and can support us in those when students are at home. And then you saw a snippet of employability and employability also looks like learning to do mock interviews, learning to dress appropriately, filling out applications, all of those things that we, we kind of learn to do on our own, we're teaching the students to learn to do because they need these skills in order to be able to navigate independently when they're no longer with us. Um, of course, we are a school that only serves students with exceptionalities, pretty significant exceptionalities. And what that means is every student in our building has an IEP. That means every student in our building also has IEP goals. We refer to them as PATH goals. Their goals are tailored to the domains you just saw listed, and so independent living, community access, and employability, as well as we have related services. So we have a social work on site. We share occupational therapy and physical therapy with our network, and so they come in and support our students. We have a psychologist that we share with the network. She does our evaluations. Um, we connect with services like LRS and Metropolitan as well, so that they are also providing services our, to our students and helping them sustain when they are no longer with us because we can't be with them for the rest of their lives. Uh, and so this is a big part of also our performance framework. And so the goal here is that more than 80% of our students are meeting those goals. And what that means is they're growing one prompting level. And prompting for us equates independence. And so instead of me having to point to something, I can give you some indirect um, verbal about it. Or instead of me needing to model something, I can just point to it and so that helps us identify whether or not students are becoming more independent because that's the purpose of our programming um, lovely you heard uh, I think Sean mentioned interview day when we were watching the video for the, uh, the internships interview day recently happened these are some pictures from interview day from last year what happens during interview day is we have some partners come in and do interviews with our students it is a skill that most of our students get to practice on interview day we have these external folks come in who are not us which means our students are not comfortable with them they don't know them and so it we make it mimic real life which is what we do in a lot of ways and so they get to um, interview for these jobs and then the interview was fill out these evaluation forms and tell us if they would have hired a student or if they won't hire a student and then we share that information with students we took it up a notch this year and we have some student in, in internships who apply for some managerial positions and so they actually had to interview for those managerial positions and they learned that they have those positions now and are really excited about them um, and so again anything we can do to mirror what happens outside of Opportunities Academy to help them build skill, we're going to work to do. The other thing we are doing is we are working with Studio B in order to beautify our building. Our students got the opportunity to attend Studio B last week. Um, what we did was we worked with Studio B to get to know our students because many people don't interact with our students. Sometimes you see them, you're not sure how to navigate spaces. And so if they're gonna create this beautiful mural for us, they had to have insight from our students. It's not about the staff members, it's about our students. And so the students were able to go, they were able, depending on ability, able to have the conversations with Studio B teammates about all of the things that Studio B um, you know, describes, uh, police brutality, all of those things. And it sparked some really good conversations. And also we have some students who, while they can't have those types of conversations, were able to express themselves and uh, Studio B gave them a picture of the front of our building and they were able to draw what they might want to see on it or maybe identify the colors that they would like to see on it. And so they were able to interact with our students and bring some things to life in this. Um, and we do these types of things, like take students in the, into the community, places where they've never been because we want them to have the exposure, because so often families might be nervous about taking them places. And so for us, it's also, also about that exposure. And we weave in some social skill development too, because that's critical as well. Uh, the last thing is you see our lovely students they are amazing. Um, and then we received this award from the governor this past year. And that was a point of pride for our team, especially coming out of COVID because things 
were very different and I transitioned into this role over COVID. And so we have stories after stories if you would like. Um, but what this did uh, for our team is it boosted morale because it shows that the work we are doing matters. And we know that internally, but to get that award was helpful for our team as well. Thank you. Questions? Uh, yes, I have someone else. How many students do you have at the site? 80. And what are the ages? Uh, 18 to 22. Every now and then we'll have someone who is 17 who is on the way to 18. As long as they finished high school, they can access us. Do we have any data following them once they leave your um, academy? Not yet. We have a team um, that works with our students on our network team. They have CA Next. There is a person that is dedicated to working with our students. It is a role that is relatively new. And so we are working with that team and that person specifically to make sure we have the data about what happens with our students going forward and to make sure that we are achieving our mission because it's not just about what they do when they're with us, mm -hmm. it's also about when they're not with us. I think that would be great to gather that information. Yep. Mr. Marshall? You asked the questions, and I, oh, she also gave some answers, but I'm a number of students, et cetera. Okay. Dr. Batista? Yes, first of all, I'd like to commend you, Ms. Scott, for the fine job that you all are doing at the um, academy where you're working, um, that you were able to bring to life some of the real life experiences of the students and seeing them too depicted within your presentation meant an awful lot to me. I just have one overarching question. Where are you located? The easiest way to describe it is everybody knows where Home Depot is off Earhart. You see it off the bridge. We're yeah. right behind there. You're right in that area. Mm -hmm. Okay. Like right behind there. Okay. Thank that you, was sir. my final question. Okay. <laughs> it, um, once upon a time was the Gus building. Kip Central City was in it. 2019, we became the, the occupants. Ms. Bodwin? Thank you so much for being here and for this great presentation. Um, how do families get, how, how do students get to you? How can, if they're interested in your program? Through one app. Okay. Yeah, we work uh, with some schools to make sure that students who have access to us know about that so that we can contact families. It, we are a small school, so lots of people don't know about that. So make sure you tell people about us. Also make sure you come and visit, but one app is the primary source. Great, and then I'll just um, a plug. I think all of our student, our schools should be teaching students how to catch the bus. Just right <laughs> from a transit planner husband to your ears. <laughs> all of our kids should know how to ride the bus so that they don't have to buy cars anymore. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, what's your capacity? How many students? Uh, right now, we are hoping to one day get to 100 in the next five years. Right now, it is about 80. Well, you're doing an outstanding, amazing job with Thank the you. young people that we witnessed today. And that was a very professional video that you showed us. You all can go into business. <laughs> Thank you so much, Board Member Parker. Yes. Um First off, Ms. Scott, thank you for the presentation. I have the pleasure of knowing a couple Opportunities Academy students through my church, okay. and they love your school. They love OA. They talk about it constantly. And um, Robert, Raquan, Chance, all of them, yes, they love OA. So that I think that probably means more than the governor's award. Uh -huh, they, it they, does, absolutely. They, they absolutely love it. Um, a question I have for you, uh, two questions. One, are the students at Opportunities Academy, are they collegiate academy students or are they tied to ascending school? Citywide. They're, so they're all, well, I mean, like, if I am a student that would benefit from uh, Opportunities Academy and I'm at, say, Warren Easton, mm -hmm. uh, when I become eligible, am I, is my, like, accountability tied to Warren Easton, but I go to school every day at Opportunities Academy or do I fully enroll at... You fully enroll okay. at Opportunities Academy, yes. Okay, that's good to know. And then um, I would imagine, you know, a lot of us, a lot of the students in our district have challenges. I would imagine your student population has additional layers of challenge onto their everyday lives. What sort of, sort of support are you doing for uh, students to help navigate, you know, difficult situations at home or um, connection to resources, things like that? Yeah, we have a social worker who started in October. So she's still pretty new to the team. Um, before, we had a psychologist who also knows our students and families pretty well. 
most of our students or many of our students have some sort of one-to-one -one support. And so while we have 80 students, we have 50 wonderful teammates as well. Many of them what we call job coaches, most people know as paraprofessionals or teacher assistants. And so they are the primary points of contact with families to let us know if families need things, if there are any resources that we can share. And so while our social worker can also share those resources as a team, if anybody needs anything, we just share throughout as well. Um, we also try to lean a lot on Metropolitan and LRS. Metropolitan and LRS also both have systems that people need to navigate, and so we try to do a lot of the lifting there to support families because they can do things that we don't have access to. They know things that we don't have access to, uh, and so making those connections with families is also critically important. Are you, are you, uh, are you, then Mr. Ashley. Are you limited to, but to eighty because of the capacity of the of the building or the? I'm sure there's more demand for 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 what you're doing than than eighty. Mm -hmm. So are you limited by the space? Are you limited by your resources? Uh, we would have to expand our space, and so right now we have. I'm, I'm going to offer Davis the opportunity to maybe jump in as well since he's the man behind those things. Um, right now, based on space and capacity, we can safely navigate with about five to seven additional students. We have a classroom we can push them into. It makes it hard to quantify this because the way we set up classes is really based on student ability and capacity. And so our, our classes are leveled from levels one through level five. We don't actually know which what's the most appropriate level until a student has been with us four weeks. And so we do spend the first three to four weeks taking data and where a student needs to go and then do our best to place them appropriately. And so while, while I can say like, Safely in our building right now, based on where we are downstairs, 87-ish, it's also going to depend on class size because that also depends on um, where we can put people, how many more teachers we need, if we need to hire more job coaches. And so I, I would offer that there's no one variable. school I I just have a uh, maybe two questions um on on the same Probably on the same wavelength. So, is this is this like a, is this a would, would it be considered like a type two? Are you all open across jurisdictions, or is it just Orleans? Just Orleans. Okay, type one. Okay, and then what, what does accountability look like for a school like this? It is very different. Um, we have a performance framework that is specific to the mission and values that we have. And so compliance is a really large piece of that. So making sure IEPs are done on time, making sure they actually meet the needs of students. Um, I mentioned the IEP goals and past, the past goals and their performance. And so a certain percentage of students need to be growing based on what I described earlier as well. Those are two very large components. Um, what else is the connections that we have with Metropolitan and LRS, a certain percentage of students also need to be connected to those services um, holistically to make sure that we're doing the things that we've committed to. And then my, my, my thank you. Mm -hmm. My last question is around finances. Uh, it is about that time where if you've not given to a place, uh, there's certainly places to give. My assumption is this is one of those places. Uh, and so I'm not doing the pitch for her, but if you were going to give, what does that look like for you all um, in terms of can, can people give to you all? Are you, I assume you all are a designated nonprofit uh, where for you will get a tax write-off if you give. Is that true? Is, is that all those things? All of those things are true. You Great. are doing an amazing job. Keep going. <laughs> get us some more money. Uh, Davis, Davis. What are other ways that they can contribute directly? I 
for those of you watching at home, since he wasn't in the microphone, you can go to <laughs> collegiateacademies.org Org. Uh, and donate on their donation page. What partnerships do you have presently, and do they offer any internships to your students? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so pre-COVID, we had externships. During COVID, I, I don't know if, how to refer to this because we're not post-COVID, but you know. Um, during COVID, we did <laughs> not offer externships and currently still do not because we can't control what happens in, in other spaces. And so when our students are in externships, they are not with our staff members all day. We have staff members that will float and are um, like kind of managerial to check on students, make sure that they are doing the things they need to, and to work with the partners to make sure that they're serving our students appropriately. We are hoping to open externships back up next school year uh, because COVID isn't going away and also it's a, a, a bit better controlled now. And so in opening those back up, we are hoping to be able to reconnect with our partners. Um, we've had students at the SPCA, Heard That Kitchen, the World War II Museum, um, there are my mama's kitchen. I think that's the right name because I always get it wrong. Um, so several like retail style places because again, those are jobs our students typically have access to. And so working in those spaces gives them the real life experience and not the ex not just the experiences that we're mimicking. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you for that great presentation. Thank you. You opened our eyes on this board to something I didn't know even existed. Come on over. So I promise I sure will. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Scott and the Collegiate Academies team. This concludes our November schools presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jordan, again. Next, we'll have Mr. Raphael Simmons for this month's accountability update. Before, before you start, I just wanted to tell you, uh, Ms. Jordan, I did go to the Travis Hill Art Exhibit. It was amazing. Good afternoon, Board, Board President Parker. Um, getting ready to slide into the accountability updates. Um, first up, our level two notices of non-compliance. Uh, I am happy to report there have been no new notices issued since last month's update. Um, all the directors of school accountability are currently engaged in collaboration with schools regarding a few active inquiries and continuing their site visits. Um, and also three open notices that are, three notices that are currently open will be closed this week. Did want to provide a district optimization policy update. Also, um, share some of the um, activities that have been going on. So we've continued the internal development discussions and the work. Um, also, getting feedback, mostly from um, school leaders. Uh, we've had we had office hours and we shared the, a draft of the policy in October with um, board chairs and school leaders. Um, also held office hours in uh, October as well. Um, we've com we compiled all of that feedback and discussed it as well, and additional feedback was collected this month um, during our school leaders meeting last week. Um, we received uh, just a little bit additional feedback, and we did a re revised our, um, current draft and shared that out with the board chairs and, and school leaders on November 11th before the um, um, the, actually during the holiday. And then we also um, scheduled a time for a proposal to discuss all the proposed revisions. Since we did share the policy out, um, we, didn't we didn't have a discussion. Um, still haven't received any additional feedback. We did host an office hours right before a committee meeting. Have another one coming up as well. And also I did want to share, tied to that, because these are um, the solution circles, which um, Mrs. Gardner had shared. Um, they have an indirect and direct tie to this work around district optimization. And you can tell about that was a big part of, um, big part of um, Mary's presentation earlier. Um, yesterday, we did have the, um, the how do we make in our enrollment system more effective? That is central question. The, um, also, after that, 
the school quality question was scheduled. We didn't have enough participants, so we rescheduled that for the 28th. We really want to engage a diverse group, make sure we did have some students RSVP and some parents, but um, several were not able to make it. And so we're planning to continue that engagement. Um, as the printing of this particular um, pr presentation, we plan to conclude all of those um, engagements and solution circles, which all tie directly back to Dr. Williams' ABC tours, um, even the invitations to participate. And these are questions that were lifted up most often during the ABC tours from, from a lot of the um, stakeholders. So we did plan to complete these by November 30th, but I think with the, since we had to push the date back for the quality schools question, we may have to go a little bit longer, and so the team will be discussing how, how we can manage that. And I also needed to point out, just wanted to point out just a few things that will be, that are on the agenda um, policy-wise. Notice, notice of intent, and you know, everyone here knows that we've been talking about the enrollment trends and district optimization, and, and we have a policy that we're working on regarding voluntary actions from charters. Um, we also know that we have the renewal process um, to our disposal as an authorizer, but we do want to take the opportunity to, to explore other district-directed options and actions as well that could include anything from recommending co-locations, recommending um, relocations to different buildings, um, especially when it comes to capacity and when we're looking at facility quality, just to enhance the quality experiences of our scholars and to support our district optimization efforts. And so that notice of intent is, intent is on the agenda. Also on the agenda, you'll see the uh, first reading for the transportation, um, pr transportation amendment. And um, I received a few com communications, I'm sure the board members have as well. So there might be some conversation about that as well um, during the policy section. Also, um, this is the, bringing the second reading of policy HB, about just moving the date up for voluntary surrender notices, um, mostly to be able to allow enrollment to work with families. And you know, things of th those types of decisions, they are major decisions, but as a district, we need to know, know those things a little bit earlier. And um, also on the agenda as well, um, the author school is, is looking, is asking to amend their current operating agreement. Um, this year, the Arthur School filled 25 of its 38th grade seats. They, they desire to make sure that that becomes a permanent part of their contract to offer eighth grade. Um, you see a note there that more than half of the eighth graders came from outside of the public school system, predominantly from parochial schools that end in grade seven. And so this amendment would allow the school to offer grade eight for the remainder of its current um, char charter operating agreement. And this amendment would still continue the eighth grade geographic priority. So I know that was a, a relatively short accountability update, but um, it was to the point we have a lot of things on the, on the agenda. Are there any, any questions that you have, may have for me? Just a comment. Uh, when, when you give us the noncompliance information and, and uh, those schools that are still in noncompliance and those ones that are closed, would you actually give us the specific schools each month? Yes, uh, sir. I, I know we, we, we it, you had said it hadn't changed, so we could go back and look, look. But for the audience and people that are that are looking, it would be helpful. I think if they, if they get it. Thank you for that right. feedback. I was trying to be a little different, not be as redundant, but I'll make sure that yeah, I, we'll I'm just, able to update it. I mean, month. you can make comment that it didn't change, and it's but it's in this report so that people can can see it online or whatever. Thank you, sir. Okay. Any other questions? We were trying to streamline. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Simmons and I spoke for an hour. <laughs> yeah, I'm just I'm just thinking of, of the people that may be tuning in for the first time. Absolutely. Yeah, that makes sense. We, we have yeah. it. Okay, thank you. Any any other? That is it. Thank you, Mr. Simmons. Thank you. Ms. Baldwin, to, ready to facilitate the policy committee. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, welcome to policy committee. 
Um, we are going to start with item 4.1, which is a notice of intent to consider changes to Orleans Parish School Board policies um, regarding the involuntary school closures, which Mr. Simmons just discussed. Thank you. Um, 4.2 is a first reading, an amendment to policy HA, School Board Chartering Authority. Um, this amendment expands the required grade levels for which any charter operator that is required to transport students on school buses must provide transportation. It currently provides for school bus transportation to students enrolled in grade six or below. This amendment will change the grade levels to grade eight or below. And then um, Ms. Moss, if you would come up. We've, we've heard some feedback from um, some of our partners in the school community, and so I think we have a proposed change yes and I think board council handed out uh, one sheet which uh, reflects the changes that were made since receiving the feedback from schools and others and the concern re related to high schools like the one um, that was just discussed who also um, provide services to eighth graders um, in other words it's Ordinarily, would be a high school, but they've added eighth grade um, to their portfolio of students that they serve. And so the policy had an inadvertent impact on those schools in that they would be pro provided to provide the service um, of yellow bus transportation to just one grade level of students, and that was not the intent. So also, um, it was identified that the way the policy is laid out, it speaks to requirements of the charter operating agreement when it was the intent of board members for this policy to become effective upon adoption. And so you'll see um, on the handout that references to the operating agreement have been stricken. Um, and now the section would read, each charter operator shall provide free transportation services for all students enrolled in the charter school who reside within Orleans Parish and more than one mile from the charter school's location as outlined below at a minimum. A, whatever transportation is necessary to implement any individualized education plan, IEP, for a child with an identified exceptionality without regard to how far the child resides from the charter school. B, free transportation for students enrolled in grade eight or below who reside more than one mile from the charter school with the exception of grade eight students who are enrolled in high school the earliest pickup being no earlier than 6.05 a.m. by a vehicle approved for student transportation in accordance with Bessie Bulletin 119, Louisiana School Transportation Specifications and Procedures, and C, free transportation, free public transportation, transportation payments and or reimbursements for all other students who reside more than one mile from the school. And that means all the other students um, besides those who are dressed in B, um, the younger children who are to be transported on yellow bus. So any students other than those um, different other means of providing free uh, transportation are allowed. Um, I also want to note that there are two technical edits um, that are going to be accomplished as well. Um, these don't require board approval, but I just want to call them out um, because in Section 11B2 of the policy, there was a reference to Section 10, which is actually a reference to Section 11. Some things shifted over time in the policy, and we've just noted that some of those numbers were off. And then also further down in the section, under C2, which relates to transportation for schools with admissions requirements, there's a reference to section uh, nine when it should have been 10. So those technical edits are gonna be made to that policy as well. So this is a first reading, and of course the policy will be out for another um, 30 days or so, 
um, based on the next meeting date, and schools will continue to have an opportunity to provide feedback. This change will be provided to our accountability team to share via email with uh, the school leaders, as well as posted at our website on the policy page for review so that people can see what's there now and continue to provide feedback. Thank you so much, Ms. Moss. Um, that was a very helpful and thorough uh, presentation. I appreciate that. Um, so this is a first reading, so no action is required. That's right. No. Okay. Um, any any oh, yeah sorry. any You're questions, right I, I Doctor Batista? Right My. <laughs> does does this policy change in effect speak to the issue that brought this issue to? Uh, legal's attention, yes. i.e., that charter, I mean, type two charter school students who are in schools with grades higher than six and up to eighth, whose siblings may also be enrolled in that school, and the sibling receives the bus up to grade six, mm -hmm. but now as a result of this, the student who's in grade seven or eight would also be provided the yellow bus transportation. Yeah, just to be clear, not type twos, uh, ones, threes, and three Bs are under the school board's jurisdiction. And yes, it does resolve the issue of, say, a sibling in grade six having the yellow bus transportation and a sibling in grade eight at the same school or a different um, K-8 school not having it. So this would resolve that issue. Okay, so you're saying then it does not do type two? No, because the school board doesn't have jurisdiction over type twos. They are Bessie authorized charter schools. But it does go to the question of the type two operators mm -hmm. who are saying their policy mirrors the Orleans Parish policy. Perhaps. I'm not aware yeah, of exactly what they all right. say, but yes, it, it would. That would answer that yeah, question. That's, that's right. The, yeah. the, the issue in question, uh, that Dr. Batista is bringing up, mm -hmm. the, the school was mentioning mm -hmm. that they were just following Orleans Parish yeah. School Yeah, and if policy. they continue to do that and revise their policy accordingly, then theirs will reflect the correction as well. Thank you. Any other, Mr. Parker? Um, thank you, uh, Ms. Moss, for that update and for working so quickly to respond to the feedback. I just want to point out this is exactly why we have this policy process. It's working very well. Thank you, Ms. Bodwin. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Ms. Eames, for bringing this policy. Um, for those who are interested, how will they view this updated policy? Will it be posted to board docs? Should they reach out um, to a board member? No, number? it'll be posted on the policy page at the website. So if you go to the website and to the board policy link, um, the front page of that will have um, pending policy updates. And under there, we'll have this version of the policy for review with a note that says when the board um, will potentially um, consider the policy for adoption. Great, thank you so much. Mr. Zervagon. Yeah, it's not really an issue this time, but just to put a pin in, in something regarding this board's authority to change policy, which, which is broad and, and I think uh, used very carefully and judiciously, but there was some time ago where there was often fear among the operators that the board would throw out a pretty dramatic policy change, which could have significant economic uh, financial impact on the school site, and that uh, we are sensitive and aware of this. And I know that for the last like six or seven years, the board and central office has been very careful mm -hmm. to take this into account, to work with the operators, to give it time, as, as mm -hmm. Ms. Parker alluded to. Um, and I believe that everyone's sort of doing this anyway, it's low financial impact in this case, but just to remind us to mm -hmm. consider that whenever we're going through policy in our very careful way that we do. And to be clear, in our policy around changes to policies that govern charter schools, it provides schools with the opportunity to provide the board with feedback on any financial impact um, that they may face as a result of a policy change so that you all are aware before making a decision about those things. Any further questions on this item? Okay. Um, the next um, items 4.3 through 4.36 are all second readings, and I think yes. 
those are all second readings. Those are the primarily legislative updates that were presented on last month. One, the bids and quotations policy has not been moved forward because of requests from board members to obtain additional information around procurement processes. So you won't see that one in the list. But today, we're asking that these be uh, approved and global to move to the full board for approval. Do we need a, a specific motion to do that? Yes, okay. Um, so I would like to make a motion that we will take items 4.3 through 4.36 in Globo. Okay. Second. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, that motion passes. So um, may I have a motion then to move this slate to the full board? So moved. Second. Um, Ms. Bowden, would you yes. specify when oh, you said this slate? Like the, the in Globo that we just said, 4.3 through 4.36, okay. right? That yes. was yes. provided in the motion. Got it. Thank you. Um, okay. So I have a motion and a second. Um, any questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. So that moves on to the full board. Thank you, Thank you. so much. Um. Is that it? All right, that's it. Um, that Ms. concludes, Gooden, yes, sir. I would like to, to say that, you know, I know all of these, ha we have to do all of this work to comply with, with the changes yeah. in the law, and et cetera. But there is something that, that we've discussed in the past, and I wanna make sure that it stays on the agenda, and that is when schools know that they are going to close, it's imminent that they, they will not be renewed or they're going to close how we deal with the, with the, the public's funds. Uh, we need to work on that and, and adjust that policy as soon as possible. So I'd like to make sure that we, we don't, you know, we don't let that, that pass us, right? It looks let's, like Ms. Moss has work. something to say. Yes, okay. I think there may need to be some clarity for the record on exactly which items are being moved forward in Globo to the full board for approval. And those are 4.3 through? 4.36. I heard 4.6, so just for the yeah, record. Yeah, just want to make it clear for the record. To Thank include you. those 30 other items. Yes, 4.3 to 4.36. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Marshall. I agree. We will keep that on. Maybe thanks for of, bringing it. You know, bringing of, it back. A day for a draft or something. Uh, month, two months, three months, something. I think we can do. I mean, I think it's. I feel like it's part of this larger discussion of the district op optimization policy changes. Um, so let's keep it part of that conversation. That way, it's happening faster than a few months. Great. Thank you. Okay, so thus concludes the policy committee meeting, and I will hand it over to Mr. Ashley for finance. Hey, you're a cheater. I just want to acknowledge that in front of everybody. There's no way you got through all those items uh, in four minutes. The swiftness. It was absolutely amazing. Thank you, Chairwoman. Take some notes. Yeah, I, I was. I was trying to figure out, can I englobo any of the things? I cannot. Uh, with that said, uh, welcome to the Finance Committee. I think we're going to get an update from Mr. Gay about our financial uh, viability for this month. Looking forward to getting the financial update. Mr. Gay. Thank you, and good afternoon, board members. Based on some of our previous lengthy contracts, that did feel like it went faster than expected. <laughs> Uh, for our finance agenda uh, for this month, we have uh, just an update on our financial statements and our uh, disadvantaged business enterprise summary from FY22. Uh, and also, would just like to mention, uh, we had another audit meeting this week. Uh, we are in the process. They're reviewing what we've done so far. We have financials to turn in by the 30th of this month, which keeps us on the time frame to be submitted by the end of, of December on time. So knocking on all of the wood, uh, we're on schedule to do that so far. Mm -hmm. 
So for the financial statements uh, for September 2022, our actual revenues of just over 1.3 million were under the budget revenues of 1.7. Uh, there is a, uh, a negative that you'll see on earnings on investments. Uh, we're making money on LAMP when we have it money when we have money invested there, uh, but we have some longer-term holdings which uh, have a um, have a negative for uh, the current period. Uh, we did we're starting to see an uptick in indirect costs. Uh, we are under budget so far for the year, but our grants management team is pushing schools uh, to submit that. Again, that's a big area of our budget this year in the general fund because of the indirect costs that we get based off of the ESSER claim. So we had a ton of claims come in. Uh, we were getting stuff done. Uh, for September 30th. Part of that was for last fiscal year, so now the emphasis is to stay into this fiscal year uh, and get those grants really moving for our schools and for ourselves. Uh, the expenses of 2.1 million were under budget by 33% for the month. Uh, overall, most of our departments are under right now. Uh, we are doing quarterly expenditure reviews with department heads to make any adjustments we need uh, to get into the second quarter. The net change in fund balance for the period was a deficit of 796000 The budget for the same period uh, was a deficit of one point two. This is the part of the year where we start to go down on cash as we uh, start to dip into the RAN um, and then just manage our overall expenses. But we do start to see some changes in the balance sheet starting this time of the year. Uh, our cash is still $41.2 million, total assets of 53.2, and you'll see cash decreased very slightly, we had an uptick in our uh, accounts receivable, or a decrease in our accounts receivable, which was good. Uh, but overall, our, our, um, our liabilities decreased month over month by 17%. And our total fund balance is just under $50 million, with 40 of it saved for emergencies, and the remainder of the balance, 2.3, since we don't directly operate schools, goes to our system-wide fund balance. Uh, with regards to our disadvantaged business enterprise, when we look at FY22, and, and we've got a couple of graphs up here, but uh, to, to frame this for you, this is all of the purchase orders for last fiscal year. So there's a lot of ways to isolate data within this uh, purchasing team, uh, Mr. Jonathan Temple, um, the whole group, you know, they, there's a lot of data that goes into this. And so we're looking at gross numbers right now. So there's, there's just some areas where we don't pick up a lot, but what we're really using this for uh, when we get into the budgeting season coming up, we're helping uh, department heads to look at what's happened historically, look for opportunities, and continue to expand our opportunities for disadvantaged businesses here in New Orleans and the state of Louisiana. But overall, we had about 11%, $6.1 million um, of total POs of 51.3. Uh, overall, I'm sorry, total POs of 57.5. So. You know, again, when you start to isolate and really look at this, and, and that's what this information is for, it's a great business intelligence tool, but if we're not putting the intelligence part to it, it's just data. So, um, you know, if you took off IDA, it's an immediate difference in the number of POs. Uh, there are some professional services, which I'll show you in just a second, which we almost have no opportunity. Like, for example, our, our risk management insurance, that's $9 million. So there's some big spend in there. The other thing I would frame you around as well is that, this is not POs that are already in progress. This was POs from last fiscal year. So if we have a multi-year PO for construction of a building, that's not included in this information as well. So again, there's a lot of ways to isolate it. It's a really great tool uh, where you can click on and, and really dig deep down to the purchase order level. That's how this whole thing is built. So they, they've framed this. It's a Tableau model uh, that, that works its way up from, from very granular data. Uh, when we start to look at it, you'll see, of course, in last fiscal year, in August and October, uh, you know, we have a big spend of our insurance policy, which hits in August. And then for Ida, we had a $13 million purchase order uh, related to that initially. And then the spend happens from there. So, again, we're looking at purchase order data. But, you know, overall, again, we were at 11% last year for our, our total um, purchases throughout the year. When we look at public works, public works is the highest percentage. Of course, there's a lot more public bid. There's some larger agreements, but, but public works as a DBE participation percentage is 28%. Uh, our lowest department, or our lowest uh, function area is materials and commodities, which is at, at 2%. But public works is, is the strongest. 
And then the other two areas, and this is excluding emergencies, uh, which is where you'd find the other stuff, but professional services, you can see of 21 million, you know, we had just under $800,000 in DBE spend. Uh, you have to, again, in, in trying to isolate where we have opportunity, uh, which is what we're looking for, property insurance is in there, which is a big chunk, that's $9 million. Uh, we have contracts with our system-wide needs program that would go to nonprofits and, and others of about $3 million. Uh, and then within our federal programs area, we spend with Catapult and some of those other service agencies a lot with non-public. Uh, and so that's another large chunk of it. But it is an opportunity in our professional services and some of our smaller to medium size agreements. I know in finance, for example, we had some outside accounting assistance. We've looked forward. Our auditors have a DB percentage within our audit that they work towards making. Uh, and so for the RAN, we have a DB component in there as well. So there's always opportunities in there to find some uh, to find some resources. And then in materials and commodities, it's 720 or 72,000 out of 3.6 million. Again, this, this is an area where we can hope to dig in. Our food service spends a lot of money. But we have to find those vendors. Uh, and so part of that vendor management, is just, it's just work that we need to do. But this, all this gives us the information that we need, again, to refine our practices. Uh, work with department heads over the next couple of months when we get into the budgeting season for next year uh, and again give them give them the resources they need to make those better decisions so uh, with that I'm happy to take any questions colleagues are, are there any questions at this time president Parker uh, yeah thank you for for this presentation mr. gay I, I've got a, a couple questions on DBE but first um, you mentioned we're pushing uh, we're working with schools to process their ESSER claims because the indirect costs are coming to the district and it's helpful uh, for us. Um, how long do schools have to submit their their ESSER claims? Well, they just wrapped the first ESSER 1. Uh, that just wrapped up. I think the claims can go through this month okay. uh, for, for that work. And then uh, 2024, uh, September, is when we start to see the it really start to fall off. There's encumbrance levels within that. So you can you could still be making claims past September 2024, uh, but there are all the funds that have to be encumbered. And the latest change in encumbrances was around capital works. So we haven't dipped into that uh, at this point for, for spend related to that, but I think they've pushed that into 2025 to where you can encumber yeah. funds past that point and, and so make those claims because they realize if you buy something today in a capital project, you may not have it for, for six months after. So they've extended those claims. And are we asking, so are we asking schools to submit their ESSER 1 claims? Or are yes. We, okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that was the big push. And we, we spent every dollar of that allocation. So that ESSER 1 allocation has been completely exhausted uh, for the allocation to the district. Got it. Okay, thank you. And then on the, the DBE information that you presented, thank you for this presentation. Thank you to Mr. Temple and, and the entire team that's working on this. Can you explain the DBE grade and how you come to those, the, the ones that are on the, the slide? ABCD. Yeah, yeah, and how you come it's, to that? It's an internal grade, but uh, mm -hmm. just for tracking purposes. And, and again, it's to start isolating by department and look for areas, but 30% and up is an A, and then it goes down five points for each letter after that. So okay. B's 25 to 30. And I know that we sometimes will approve contracts where the vendor is not certified as a disadvantaged business enterprise, but they, you know, may qualify to be one. What, um, is that a substantial amount or, or is it negligible in terms of all of these numbers that we're looking at? The problem is a couple of those big contracts can skew what the overall looks like when you really dig into the, the DB. We have a number of minority-owned businesses that are not certified. We have a number of women-owned businesses that are not certified. And so, again, I think that gets back to Mr. Temple's work and, and purchasing overall is to encourage them to get certified and show them the opportunities um, overall. But I, I don't know that that's a, that's a large section. I think Hubbard & Tennyson, for example, that does special education services uh, is a woman-owned business, but they're not certified in DBE. So exceptional children's services as a department wouldn't get credit for that on, on the DBE side. Got it. Thank you. Um, I and I'm sure some of my colleagues would love to sit with you and Mr. Temple and learn even more about this and, sure. and what we can do from a policy perspective or from a, you know, as board members to, to help increase our percentage of disadvantaged business enterprise contracts and you know increase those letter grades. So thank you. Yeah, Mr. Um, I just want to say thank you uh, to you, your team, obviously Jonathan. You know he's been talking about this for a little bit. <laughs> And to see it like this, 
I don't I don't know if I've seen any district do it this deeply in this way and then talk about how you're going to work with department heads to start to change you know behaviors because we know if you're spending under a certain amount of money under a certain amount of money there's discretion given to department heads uh, and and so to be thinking about how we can make sure those department heads are you know also thinking deeply about the DB stuff because sometimes you all are just trying to do the work and, and, and not in a negative way. It's just, you know, the idea of trying to balance that stuff. That's some cultural, that, that is like an internal cultural, uh, you know, piece that I know, you know, Dr. Williams is certainly uh, leading us towards. And, you know, I think with your leadership getting us there. And, and so I'm just, I just want to say thank you. This is a big deal. Uh, I know we're not where we want to be overall, but sometimes getting the data is like half Absolutely. the battle to determine where we need to go. And, and so you guys continue to be proactive about getting us to this place. It feels really good, I don't know about you all, to sit on a board where you have leaders who are proactively talking about how we get to that number. And you don't have folks in the audience yelling from the DBE standpoint saying, hey, can we get there? But you all are saying we're going to get there. And so there, there is like power in that. And, and I just appreciate you all continuing to show up in that way. It matters a whole lot. And if I, if I may, uh, we do have a change to our um, retiree benefits that I wanted to share. It's going from a cost to no cost, so it's not something that the board Okay, does, come on. You're saving like money now. Come on. Talk about it. Tracy Griffin Robertson to, uh, to go through that. So. Good afternoon, everyone. I think this is my first time maybe uh, speaking to some of you, so... Um, Great to have the opportunity to bring something very exciting and encouraging uh, before the board this afternoon. It is a great privilege that we have been able to transition our Medicare eligible retirees uh, from a Medicare Advantage plan where previously there was an additional cost over and above that of the Part B premium um, that all Medicare eligible retirees individuals are required to pay in order to obtain that type of um, insurance. So um, as of January of next year, we will be transitioning those individuals from the current coverage with Humana, where each retiree basically had an additional out-of-pocket expense monthly in a neighborhood of $150. So when you do the math, that's a significant savings for our Medicare-eligible retiree population. And additionally, the district had a 25% cost share there that we'll be able to kind of recognize that back in the budget also. So. Again, we're excited about being able to do that for our Medicare eligible retirees, and we just wanted to make the board aware of that. So should you run into one of your constituents out there and they ask you any questions, you're kind of on board with what we're doing. Um, and I'm just super excited that those particular individuals, in light of everything that's going on financially now, that they can observe a few extra dollars in their pockets and can maybe you know do some things that uh, they've been making some really tough decisions about um, as of now, that at least that's one thing less that they will have to worry about as of January of next year. So that's pretty much it, and I can entertain any questions that any of you may have. Thank you. I'll say, look, $1,500 a, a, a year. Annually. Yeah, mm -hmm. $15,000 10, over 10 years. Yes. That's a big, that's a big deal. Right. So, right. yeah, I just want to say thank you all for, for getting us there, uh, and I don't know how you did it, but <laughs> we're not going to even ask you. I mean, I'm going to put that on the record. Thank you for doing it. We're just gremlins. Okay, you, listen. We do the stuff in the night. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Mr. Marshall. Hi. Will they, will they all be, I'm sure they will all be notified. Yes. Just, we okay. are actively currently getting those uh, notifications out in the mail. We anticipate having it all wrapped up in the mail this afternoon. So, again, if you get a call maybe day after tomorrow, so you'll be aware of, you know, what that change is going to look like. Well. So we were able uh, to mirror the current coverage with no additional out-of-pocket expense. So this will be seamless for those retirees, but they get to recognize 100% savings in that current monthly expenditure that goes away in January. Well, I have some personal friends now that I can turn that frown upside down. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's great. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Thanks, everyone. Uh, I'll just pile on and say thank you very much. This is um, 
this is something that matters for real people. And it's also something that is just a great example of how the work that you and your team is doing, uh, everybody on your team, Mr. Gay, is doing impacts students in, in this district as well by Absolutely. freeing up additional funds and uh, you know working for the people who serve this district for many, many decades. Um, so thank you. You're really welcome. grateful. <laughs> so great movie under budget this month. Got some DVE stuff. We saving money on the on 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 the finance. Come on, y'all. This is this is a moment. I just Not want fast, to understand. but it's effective, and we appreciate it. It's slow, right. thank but you. it's good work. <laughs> All right, good. All right, feeling good. Let's move on, Mr. Gary. We are are, are you? Does that conclude your presentation? Awesome. Uh, let's move on to action items. 5.2, I say action items, uh, 5.2, Second Amendment to contract with Pelican State's partners for professional governmental relations services. It's recommended that the Orleans Parish School Board approves the Second Amendment to the contract with Pelican State partners for professional government relations services in the amount of $95,400 and authorizes General Counsel to prepare a contract amendment for signatures of the board president and the contractor. May I have a motion to uh, move action item 5.2 to the full board for consideration? So move. I have a motion by Mr. Marshall. Is there a second? Second. I have a second by Ms. Seams. Uh, is there any cards on this issue? Seeing none, is there any comments from the board? Hearing none, uh, I'm going to call for a question. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none, that motion carries. Uh, that item will be heard at the full board uh, on Thursday. Moving on to... Action item 5.3, request to award ITB number 22-FAC-0051 for hydronic pipe replacement at Moore's Jeff ES. It's recommended that the Orleans Parish School Board accepts the bid from Bannister Global Services Network in the amount of $345,000, $345,800 for the replacement of the hydronic pop piping at Morris Jeff ES, uh, uh, which is elementary school, and authorizes uh, the general counsel to prepare a contract for signatures of the board president and the contractor. May have a motion to move item uh, 5.3 to the full board. So moved. Second. <laughs> I have a motion by uh, Ms. Bowen, a second by President Parker. Um, is there any cards on this item? Seeing none, is there any discussion from the board at this time? Hearing none, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none, that motion carries. Uh, that I will be considered for the full board uh, Thursday's meeting. Um, with that said, that concludes uh, my finance committee, the, fi the finance committee, uh, which is a shared committee. It's not just mine. Um, and so I'd like to welcome back uh, Chairwoman Bowen to lead us through property. Thank you. Um, aftercare starts in 45 minutes, just for a time check. Um, we, Ms. Delcor is um, out today, so we have the pleasure of Ms. Secures again this month. So um, if you want to take it away for our capitals and facility update presentation. Awesome. Thank you. Good afternoon, board members and Superintendent Williams. Today I will be presenting the November capital projects and facilities updates again. <laughs> For today's agenda, I will be updating the board on capital projects being managed by both NOLA PS as well as the Recovery School District. I will also provide a high-level overview of the planned, unplanned, and emergency capital projects that are currently ongoing, and I will close this out with a quick update on where we are with our property development strategy. The auditorium seats for the McMain High School auditorium renovation have arrived and the contractor has begun the installation process. They are completing the installation of the new stage floor and making all floor repairs throughout the entire building. Uh, ADA handrails have been installed on the exterior ramps and they are finalizing the installation of the mechanical piping. 
This project is scheduled, was scheduled to be completed in December. However, there is some mechanical equipment that will not arrive or actually be shipped until January. So we will get temporary occupancy in December with full substantial completion sometime February, early March. For the Douglas High School auditorium renovation, the auditorium seating at the balcony level is 100% complete, and they're about 25% complete for installation of the seating at the lower level. The stage floor is complete, and it is beautiful. All of the restoration work around the proscenium has completed, and they are in the process of finalizing all of the restroom renovations. Sorry. The new construction of the Walter Cohen High School is substantially complete, and we were excited that the board got to see a preview of the beautiful new school. Fixtures and furniture and equipment are scheduled to be delivered and installed next week, so we're excited about that. The contractor is completing the installation of the gym bleachers and finalizing all punch list items. The school is still set to move in over the winter break for the anticipated start for the students of January 5th. The Rosemary Loving Elementary School renovation project is moving along nicely. The contractor is continuing to work on all punch list items on the first and second floor of the main building. They are finalizing all landscaping around the building and the delivery and installation of fixtures, furniture, and equipment is scheduled for next week. For the Early Learning Center, the contractor is continuing to work on the installation of exterior windows and they are completing the plaster and siding installation on the building. The mechanical, electrical, and plumbing equipment are being installed in the new gym facility as well as the new gym equipment. Both the gym and early learning, learning center are still scheduled to be substantially complete this December. Jeannie, can you, um, Ms. Eames, I think had a question yes. um, about Good. Cohen, excuse me. <clears throat> Upon uh, visiting Cohen a couple of weeks ago, uh, the color, li the lime green in the foyer area and kind of throughout, kind of threw me off. So has that been looked at, and are they going to change it to the Kelly green, which is the color uh, <laughs> of the um, of the actual um, colors of the school? It was quite a bright green. I do yes. agree. We are working with the RSD and the project managers to look at trying to revise that that green on the first floor. So we will give you a definite answer at the next meeting of how we're going to do that. But we are looking into that. Thanks. We understand that. Thank you. <clears throat> the Dr. Alice Joffrey High School renovation project continues to be ahead of schedule. The installation of the entry storefront glass is 100% complete. The coffee shop front counter has been installed. The contractor has completed the installation of the lighting in the student's common, student commons area. The collaborative courtyard is coming along nicely. All lights have been installed, and the contractor is finalizing the installation of the stucco. This project is anticipated to be completed at the end of this year. Next is a quick update on our planned, unplanned, and emergency capital projects. So for the school facility plan capital projects, we have selected all of our designers and now we are in designer contract phase. Out of the 21 projects planned, 20 are now in contract execution phase and one project is in the bid phase. The school facility preservation unplanned and miscellaneous projects are our next update. We have selected engineers for four of our unplanned projects. Currently, one project is in the investigative phase to determine the scope of work. One is in design and three are in the construction phase. Can I ask a question here? Excuse me. Um, for those of us who are not schooled in like how to develop and redo a project, a, a school building, can we get like a list of what the different phases or the different milestones that these projects are going to go through so we kind of know what that means in the grand scheme, like where okay. these things are moving along? Absolutely. Okay. Just so we know like is that early? Is it mid? <laughs> is it late? Is it good? Is it bad? Good Just point. to be able to track it. Thank you. Absolutely. 
And finally, our emergency projects, which consist of Hurricane Ida and other emergencies. We have five that are currently in design. Three are in the bid phase. There are nine that are currently in construction. And we're happy to report that five have been substantially complete. Uh, Jeannie, if I, if I may ask a question on, on these emergency projects. Um, just one that is on my mind is Crossman. Uh, where are we at with the, I, I see it's in construction right now. Do you have, I don't expect you to know the answer off the top of your head, but if you could just follow up with we me. We do, we're about 90% full okay. at Crossman. We had to do some um, roof work, but we're back in the building. We're hoping to be done before Christmas. Great, thank yep. you. Our next update relates to our property development strategy and framework. We are continuing the process of creating the property development strategy. A few things that we've been focusing are engaging with city leaders to gain a better understanding on the land use as it relates to the city's master plan. We are continuing to onboard our new director of capital planning, Skyla Wilson, so that she is up to date on all phases that will be leading into the community engagement phase that will kick off early next year. Our external stakeholder meetings are ongoing and we are developing the community facing overviews that will be rolling out early next year. As part of the framework for our property development strategy, we will begin our initial phase of community engagement beginning in January of 2023. Our goal is four community meetings that are focused on our communities as it relates to the district's vacant property. At the next board meeting, we will be providing an overview for overview of this information and materials that will be presented to the community in January. This concludes my report. Be happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you so much. Um, any additional questions from what we've already asked? No, great. Thank you so much. Thank you for the update on the property development strategy as well. Really Thank excited you. to see that continuing to move. Okay. So we are going to move on to 6.2, sorry, which is an action item. It's a lease for 1331 Curlerock Street to the New Orleans Career Center. It's recommended that the Orleans Parish School Board approve a three-year facility lease for 1331 Curlerock Street with New Orleans Career Center who was awarded a request for proposal number 18-0026, which sought a lead partner and facility manager for the career center at the facility. Um, can I have a motion to move this item 6.2 to the full board? No move. A second. <laughs> Anybody not want to move? Um, okay, we have a motion and a second. Do we have any public comment on this? Um, any board questions or comments? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right, that moves on to the full board. Thank you very much. Um, item 6.3 is resolution 20-22. Um, yes, ma'am. Should I just hand it over to you? I can read. I can see it. Thank you. Okay, so this is resolution 20-22, um, signature authority for the state capital outlay funding for the Ninth Ward multi-sport venue in Eastern New Orleans. It's recommended that the Orleans Parish School Board approves resolution 20-22, authorizing the superintendent or her designee to perform ministerial and administrative acts on behalf of the Orleans Parish School Board as required by the state of Louisiana for the receipt of capital outlay funding pursuant to the cooperative endeavor agreement between the state of Louisiana, Ninth Ward Stadium Inc. and Orleans Parish School Board to fund a multi-sport venue in Eastern New Orleans and the Lower Ninth Ward. Um, may I have a motion to move this item 6.3 to the full board? So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. Um, it's been moved and seconded. Do we have any public comment on this or board questions or comment? All right. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. That passes on as well. Thank you. And that is the end of my second committee. I'm going to hand it over to Mr. Marshall for the innovation and stability. Thank you all. Th thank you, board member Baldwin. Uh, we will now have... Uh, uh, Dr. Fatima Fulmore present an update on the NOLA PS Portrait of a Graduate. 
All right. Greetings, President Parker, board members, um, and Dr. Williams. Great to see you this afternoon. I am delighted to provide you with an update on our portrait of a graduate work. There we go. All right, so we are just thrilled about um, the progress that we're making with the portrait of a graduate. And I just recently read an article and did an activity with our district leadership team today, and there was a quote in the article that said, and it was a 2021 article out of Edutopia, and it said, the portrait of a graduate is one of the single most important work that you can do as a school district to transform student success for your organization. And so we recognize that the work is important. It's critical to how we reimagine and rethink student success. And so to that end, we are framing the portrait of a graduate work in three key areas. The first is that this will be a collective vision that values the hope, dreams, and aspirations of our students. Um, it's not about us as adults, it's about their future and their success. The second is that the portrait of a graduate will reflect the traits, skills, and attributes that our students should embody for today and beyond. So not only do we want them to be ready post-secondary regardless of the path that they choose, but we want them to be developing these skills right now every day in school. And the last thing is that our portrait of a graduate will provide strategic direction for us as a school district to reflect the overall educational experience for our scholars. So as we reimagine our strategic plan of action, this is at the center, this is at the core of our work because this is a collective commitment across our district to what we believe that our children can accomplish, what we believe that they deserve, and what we are willing to commit to and deliver um, on our promise for our scholars. So this work is outlined to happen in four phases. Um, during phase one, we spent time introducing the concept of a portrait of a graduate to you all, to our school leaders, um, doing the research on what this could look like for our district. Now we are in phase two, which is all about engaging and starting to design the portrait of a graduate. This is where we're spending our time um, meeting with folks, using our survey data, developing a design team, engaging our students in focus groups so that we can start to shape what this work will look like. In phase three, that will start at the top of the year. Now we're starting to put more content into the portrait of a graduate. It's not just five, six, seven attributes, it's content driven, and that will start to build out as we solidify what this is gonna look like. Phase four is all about adopting and launching. That's when we come to you in its final form, and yes, you will be able to see the work along the way, but this is when we come to you in its final form to say, this is the portrait that we want to move forward with. Let's do the work to launch and start socializing and branding this work for our district and across our city. At the culmination of that work, there are four things that we hope to achieve. These are our driving outcomes. The first is how do we use the portrait of a graduate to drive post-secondary readiness to ensure that our students are ready for college career life no matter which path that they choose? How do we use the portrait of a graduate to enhance the student learning experience to enrich what's happening in the classroom? How do we use the portrait of a graduate to drive collective impact? How do we make this bigger than just NOLA public schools? How do we unite our city around this portrait of a graduate so that the impact is far reaching in different aspects of our students' lives? And alas, how do we as a system of schools develop a unified North Star, a common commitment, a common vision towards our scholar's success? So these are four driving outcomes that are at the undergirding our work as we continue to develop the portrait of a graduate. 
So part of our engage in design work has focused on internal engagement first. This is where we're doing the work, one, to talk to NOLA public school staff, to engage our school administrators, our school leaders, and our board chairs for the charter schools. Um, and some of the things that they've shared, this is just a snapshot of some of the comments when we asked the question, what are your hopes, dreams, and aspirations for our scholars? So this is adults responding about what they hope and dream for our scholars. So as you look at these, you see some commonalities is that at the end of the day, we want the best for our students. We may not know what that will look like for them 20 years from now when they're in a, th a three-year-old coming out of high school, what it may look like five years from now for uh, an eighth grader or a ninth grader. But at the end of the day, you can see from the voices of our people that they want our students to be ready. They want our students to have options. They want them to be academically um, prepared. They want them to be able to work with other people and they want our scholars to know themselves. So that's critically important and as we continue to do the work, you will see more of that in terms of where we have common hopes, dreams, and aspirations for our students. So during this part, I'm spending a lot of time talking to students um, and focus groups because they make up our design team. So what you see here was the very first um, meeting I had with a student focus group at Ben Franklin. Um, and it was about 30 kids and we spent our time working through an activity to dive deeper into the student perspective around this work. Um, I sent out 18 invitations to 18 different schools representing different networks for them to sign up for me to come in and talk to their students. So what you see here on the list are some of the schools that have already um, requested for me to come out and meet with their kids. So far I have met with um, Ben Franklin, Dorothy Height, Warren Easton, Langston Hughes, um, and the Willow School so far. So some of these schools are scheduled and we will also send out another round of invitations for me to visit schools in December as well to continue that focus um, group work. Also the survey launch for our students to complete so that we're not just hearing the voices of the focus group, but we're creating opportunities for all students across our schools to respond. So I started that work yesterday when meeting with um, the Willow School in Dorothy Heights. So I started getting responses. You will start seeing that information on our social media outlets and we will communicate that to our schools after the break where they can access that in our charter newsletter. So the student part will start circulating first. So it's interesting and I'm gonna highlight a piece for you. Um, so you can see a little bit more about that. But in the engagement, here's what our students are doing. They're looking at common portrait of a graduate attributes. This is the same process that we will take our design teams through that our stakeholders will also see. Our students are looking at common portrait of a graduate attributes and they are building consensus around what are the most important to them. We're having conversations about what do they want to do with their futures, and I will tell you, some of the things that they have said, I'm like, I did not even conceive of at their age. We have students that want to be architects and sports agents at the same time so that they can build the facilities that they're going to put athletes in. I mean, these are the things that our students are thinking about, and when they tell me what skills they feel like they need to be able to do this, I'm like, let's can we hire them today? They are ready, they got it. And so it's, it's been really deep conversation with our students. Then on the other side of that is the sample of a portrait of a graduate that we first introduced during phase one. So our students are diving deeper into the sample to see what do they like about that particular portrait. So if they had to choose one that was extremely important to them, what would they lift up? So they're going through a process of starting to build their own as a team. I intentionally put them in groups so that they know that even though you have your individual choices, everything won't make it, right? So how do we learn to work together to advocate for what we believe is important and come to a common portrait for our group? And so that's what our students have been doing using these two examples. 
So here are some pictures from some of our engagement. You see students from Langston Hughes Academy, Warren Easton Ninth Grade um, Academy, and Ben Franklin in this slide. So you can see some of their group work with each other. They're talking through both of those examples, and they're trying to build consensus. And I see some future attorneys in some of these groups because they are they will go toe to toe on why they believe you know one particular attribute should make it versus another. So our students are really thinking about this. Um, in this picture as well, you'll see some additional snapshots of our students from Ben Franklin, Langston Hughes Academy, and Warren Easton. Now what I would like to do is just give you a, a little insight to how we summarize the time with the students. I pull them together in like a small group and I ask them a couple of questions. I want to briefly let you hear about, hear from this ending session with um, Ben Franklin students about what's important to them and why they think the, the portrait of a graduate would be good for our district. All right, Ben Franklin, thank you guys so much for an awesome student engagement session today around the portrait of a graduate. Um, it was really exciting to see you all work together to build consensus around the attributes that you feel like are most important to student success in school and what you think is most important for students no matter which path they choose when they graduate from high school. So outstanding work um, today. Um, now that we know a little bit more about the portrait of a graduate, why do you think that's something that's important for us as a school system, as a school district? Why is it important for us to have a portrait of a graduate? Um, I think a portrait of a graduate kind of like lays down a silhouette for like what a student can follow like past high school and it gives them some example about what type of attributes they'll need past high school no matter like what path they take whether they decide to like go to college whether they decide to kind of like figure out themselves on their own they need something to like aspire to and different goals like perseverance and like collaboration things like that help that person to form themselves no matter like what path they take after high school. Yeah, um, I just wanna continue off of that. It sets sort of like the expectation that students will need and look forward to. Like in college, these are like ideal steps that you need to do whatever you wanna accomplish, whatever that may be. But it's more of like, oh, instead of academically, oh, I need to learn this, this, and this. It's like generally like over, um, over everything seeing some key steps and like important things that you need to know before advancing to the next step in life. Good, good, good. So now I want to ask you, and when you answer, say your name and your grade, right, when you answer, so we know who's represented. Um, after looking at the portrait of, of a graduate attributes that we studied today, which one was most important to you and why? So share your name and your grade. I'll start. <laughs> she wasn't ready and asked me to start on the um, other side. My name is Malachi Shen. I am in 12th grade. And I believe the most important one was um, skilled communicators. I think that's what it was. And I believe uh, this was like the most important one because as you go on to like later stages of life, you have to learn to like communicate with your peers effectively. Um, in jobs, you're always working with other people. And to do that like the most efficient way possible. And um, in the friendliest way possible, it's best to like be able to like develop these skills now, so then when you go in later, you'll have these. Um, my name is Austin Obuffy, and I'm a senior. And I think my favorite one was persevering achievers, because I don't believe that you have to be like naturally smart or gifted, but like if you just work hard and persevere, you can achieve any goal that you want. So. My name's Jonathan Burge, and I'm a ninth grader. And one attribute that really stuck out to me was civic engagers. And I had said pretty much exactly this back in the room, but I really think that, I mean, as a person, there's only so much change that I can personally affect in my life. But if I can, ex if I can inspire others to affect change, then the scope of my effect on change is really broadened and I think
that's very important. So you guys get the gist of what's happening here. So they each go around to, to say what's most important to them. For every group that we meet with, we've been able to capture these sessions with them. And I want to um, thank our social media manager, Rashida Williams, who travels with me to all these videos. She's doing, taking the pictures. She's right there. She's taking the pictures. She's, you know, recording everything. She's doing a fantastic job working with me, capturing these moments for our students. And these are the things that we want to highlight um, over the course of the next few months why this is important to our students. This is an example of the social media um, uh, picture that you'll see circulating where our students get to take the survey. Um, so they'll be able to respond and share with us what's the most important attributes to them. They can also let us know what's missing, like what didn't we capture that should be part of it as well. So that will, you will start to see that more and more on our social media outlets. Also, throughout this engagement phase, what I've outlined here are some of the sessions that we've offered for different stakeholders to join in and learn more about the portrait of a graduate work. And it also gives them the opportunity to take the survey at the end of that engagement, so if they haven't already done so. Um, what I really want to draw attention to is where it says, um, external design team members. So that meeting is tomorrow and we sent out um, roughly 50 invitations to external partners across the city to be part of the external design team. Um, we took recommendations and we looked at those individuals who the work that they do in that organization directly speaks to um, youth development, workforce development, college and career readiness, um, social and emotional development, recreational, all of those things that pertain to youth. We try to reach out to those partners where this is their expertise, this is their jam, and we want them at the table. And so last time I checked, we had more than half of the invitations that we sent out accepted. We've also had some members to say, while I can't attend the information session, I still want to be part of the design team and they will join us for the first uh, December meeting. We also have external members from NOLA PS that will be added to that design team so that we have one team that is doing the work to continue breaking down the, the data, and helping to solidify what the portrait of a graduate looks like. Upcoming engagement, um, so we talked about the launch of the video um, and the student portrait of a graduate, but after um, Thanksgiving, it will go more broadly. So that's when we will start engaging school staff, the community will have access to it. So all of our other stakeholders will have access to the survey to start giving their feedback. We also plan with our teachers um, via the teacher advisory and some work that we're doing in partnership with NSNO with teachers to do the deeper work of what does this look like by grade band. So when we're talking about pre-K two, three, five, six, eight, nine, twelve, to have teachers at the table to identify those I can statements for each of the attributes. So that work, the depth of that work is a little later and it comes with once we've identified what the attributes are. So this is the second half of our engagement that you can look forward to. So with that, I will take your questions. Mr. Marshall. Oh, I'm sorry. Certainly. Are you a part of that external design team? Uh, I have no, <laughs> no, I'm not at this point mm -hmm. in time, but I tend to be, yes. I mm -hmm. just saw all of the different uh, mm -hmm. organizations uh, within the city involved, and I was just wondering if we had representation. Uh, not at this time. And but that's we, just a we sample. Certainly, but we right. certainly will. Right, and that is a sample representation. That list is not exhaustive of all the invitations that we sent out. Um, as part of in our, you know, our board, 
you are welcome to be part of anything that um, that we're doing with this work. So yes, you all will have the invites and any of you can be part of it. It's not just reserved to any board member. So all of you can be engaged in this throughout any process. But in terms of invitations, those are external to the district and so that's who that went to. To, to that, mm -hmm. would you please give us the, the entire schedule, uh, time, place, et cetera, so if any of the mm -hmm. board members would like to Absolutely. You know, participate, uh, they can? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Yep. How's the participation? Oh, I'm sorry. No, please. Mm -hmm. Please, please, please. I was just wondering about mm -hmm. participation from the schools. Uh, I saw the list of schools mm -hmm. that were participating thus far. Uh, we have some that's a little hesitant of joining um, this wonderful committee. So it's the choice of school leaders. They all are given the invitation at the end of the information session to see if they want to be part of the design team, if that makes sense. Some have chosen, like, I don't want to be part of the design team, but I want to continue to be engaged in some capacity. So just because school leaders or school administrators are not part of the design team, that doesn't mean that they won't be engaged. So some prefer to just respond to service to continue to receive the updates. That list is just for external organizations that are not under the NOLA PS umbrella. So that's not reflective of some of the school leaders who have said that they would like to be part of it, the design team, if that makes sense. Yeah, I just wanna say, um, thank you to my colleague. Mr. Marshall, this has been a long time coming. I didn't have no gray hairs when you started mm -hmm. this discussion five years ago. I have several now, and I, you know, I just want to acknowledge that. And a, and, and a new baby. <laughs> this is so true. Yeah, you know, this is such a you know for the new administration to, I think, champion this work and to reinforce some of the things that you've been saying in data. Mm -hmm is is the right thing and and so I'm just very grateful to the new administration but I'm largely grateful to my colleague for trying to get us on the right track around this work and I think our young people said it best in that video about why this is important as well and so mm -hmm. you know sometimes you know Nolan has been yelling at us about this for a while and, and I think out of the mouths of babes right so mm -hmm. thank you dear brother thank you thank you Comment? yes please go ahead yeah, also, um, I really appreciate the model that, that y'all are using uh, to develop a total community engagement towards a process for this kind of strategic design. And uh, I just think it's brilliant and definitely replicable and something mm -hmm. that ought to hopefully gain attention from others as to the property to do it. I haven't been a high school teacher in this case at Ben Franklin. I know that when you, when you ask them, they will tell you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And they are a very good source mm -hmm. to go to. So I really love the respect for the, for the students throughout the city. Also, mm -hmm. the process shows that it warms my heart to see that engagement and that they are, uh, in turn, participating. Mm -hmm. And to see that kind of uh, buy-in from the schools and the school leaders it is, is a wonderful thing to see so far. And I hope that this kind of participation continues. This has been marvelous. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And if you guys already haven't done so, um, we did share the survey with you all via board update. So if you haven't had an opportunity to take the survey, please make sure that you also include your voice in the survey and that you're able to outline those traits that are also important to you, lending itself to your personal experience and what you feel like our students also need to be ready for. So please also complete that for um, yourselves as well. Yes. Uh, I was also going to start with a thank you to Board Member Marshall, but first I have to say, uh, Mr. Ashley, some of us would love to have gray hairs instead of hairs that fall out. Um, but, but Mr. Marshall, thank you again for all your work here. Um, I know you have pushed this for many, many years, and we're excited for it um, to get off the ground. And Dr. Fulmore, to you, thank you for all of the work that you've put in, put in on this thus far. It is extensive. It is broad, it is deep, it is um, really exciting to see, and I'm excited to see where we end up. Uh, to our schools who are listening or watching right now, I just would encourage you to deeply engage in this process. Um, 
because you're given very many opportunities. And so I want to make sure that you engage in this process. And when you, um, when you bring your students to the table, make sure you're bringing a wide range of students to this discussion and not just the elected representatives, not just those who are academically successful. Make sure that you're including students from all walks of life, from all student populations uh, to be a part of this because it should, be a, it should be a conversation that includes everybody. So again, Dr. Fulmer, thank you so much for your work. Um, this is very impressive and I can't wait to see where we go from here. Absolutely, thank you. Any other questions? Any other questions, comments? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Dr. Fulmore. Um, as I stated when you first made your first presentation, I, I really respect your, your organizational skills and everything that you put into this. You know, you've come with a certain level of experience and expertise in this area that is sorely needed to get this job done, and I appreciate it. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you. Well, well, we'll continue with a, another uh, slide presentation, and that is about this committee and, and what is the intention uh, of this committee. Uh, this is something else that has been long overdue that we are now, and I'd like to thank, <laughs> go back to my, my fellow board member, Ethan Ashley, who actually committed this uh, to a resolution almost two years ago now. And it's taken us quite a long time to get to this point where we can actually start doing some work. Uh, and, but before we do that, uh, I want to di digress just a little bit and take a privilege to talk about that. Uh, never mind, I'll follow the script. The theory, this is a, the theory of change for this uh, committee. You have to, you have to forgive me there's so much in my head that I want to talk about, and my fellow board members know that uh, I can talk for hours about this, this subject. But I'm going to follow the script, so I'll be brief. The theory of change in this committee. The Orleans Parish School Board's vision statement clearly articulates the goal of preparing students to maximize their potential and be successful socially, economically, and civically. With this vision in mind, the Innovation and Stability Committee, ISC, seeks to help students prepare, help schools prepare students for the transition from the classroom to professional, social, and civic life, create opportunities and conditions for schools to help students meet human developmental needs, and promote creative experiences and programming resulting in social change and a better quality of life through better prepared students. <laughs> the theory of action, the first phase of it, is defining quality education. I've talked to so many people about developing the whole child, educating the whole child, our future citizens, but we don't all agree. We have not come to a consensus. And that's what, that's what the portrait of graduate is, is for this community to become together to define the outcomes we want for our children, to define a quality education so that we can all be marching in the same direction on the same path. Defining quality education by the creation of a graduate profile to serve as a North Star in the holistic development of students, the holistic development of students. The profile will clearly establish the qualities, skills, and attributes expected in having received a quality education. It's the whole child. It's what you want in your neighbor. It's what you want in your future citizens. It's what you want in your wife, your husband, your employer, your employee. It's everything. It's human development. The ISC, in the work that it's going to do, will do that with the community to help schools create these future citizens by establishing 
focus groups with school and community leaders to identify opportunities, remove barriers, and propose solutions to current challenges. See government grant and philanthropic funding to obtain the resources necessary for existing and future initiatives. Encourage, organize, and facilitate caregivers and community involvement to support students and schools. It's where we will come together, the board and the community, to do the work that's necessary to deliver on the promise, to deliver on the promise of our vision statement. The focus group questions. In reviewing the list of potential focus group topics on the next page, please consider the following questions. Who are individuals or organizations to invite for participation in a particular group or groups? Are there additional topics to include? You'll see a wide range of topics, expanding partnerships with community organizations, recognition, motivation, and culture, educator recruitment and retention, high quality PSA or PTO organizations, facility upgrades and enhancements, programming and partnerships for the creation of values and character development, access to summer enrichment, financial literacy, parenting, sex and career education, student leadership development, Closing the, individual, the, the, <coughs> the digital divide, career internships and pathways, civic engagement, college scholarship opportunity research, program development, student support and tracking. And trust me, there are many others that people have mentioned to me that didn't make this list of topics. And I've been advised by some to say, let's narrow it down to just the two or three or four or five that we can possibly get done. And the answer to that is with the massive resources of the community and doing it this way in focus groups, we don't have to narrow it down. We can do as much as the community wants to help us do. We can have a focus group for each one of these to research, develop, come up with an implementation plan, and work with schools to deliver to our schools these, these different opportunities. For, those, for the community to begin to participate, they can go to a survey and fill out the survey and the survey very clearly gives us the information that we will need to build the focus groups in areas where people show interest in participating. We can do as much as you will help us do. And this is what we say to the community. Now this is supposed to be a committee where this is ongoing. It's not the beginning or the, or the end, it's the beginning of how we do business in the future. This committee is somebody as one of our school leaders told me just the other day, Nolan, I have a great idea for your innovation committee. Well, maybe in December he'll come and present that idea to us. So it's the beginning. It's how we will work and use the assets of the community to help deliver on our promise. And to that, I would like to now open it up to my fellow board members to ask questions, to make comments, to uh, let us know where we are. Well, and I know you've got several. Yeah, I've, I've got a, <laughs> I'm your plant, I've got a question here. Um, so one of the questions you asked is, uh, are there additional topics to include? I, my first question is, is, can you give a little bit more information on this second one that's listed, the recognition, motivation, and culture? 
What do you mean by that so that we can Well, I'll things. give you an example of what could be discussed as a topic in this area, okay? Um, you know Troy Duhon gives a car away, right? Every year to seniors. So in conversation with him, I said, how can we have greater impact? Because the two things we need students to do, right? The two things, show up and do their best, right? So with that, that's a motivation tool for seniors to show up. If you show up, you have the possibility of winning a car. So how do we expand on that, right? So that there are national organizations like the Johnson's Corporation with the Renaissance Program and things like that, that address recognition and motivation, right? So a focus group could be about how do we work with schools to incentivize kids to show up at every grade level, right? It's where we come together to begin to discuss these things in a very robust manner in which we can then go out and, and if necessary, get businesses to participate and contribute, right? Like Troy is already talking to NASA and the advocate of how they could do something at the 10th grade, 11th grade, right? So that, at every, but that's, a, that's an example of what we can do there. And when you address recognition and motivation, you do also do it with your, with your teachers, you do it with your staff, your, your volunteers, uh, you look at all of those things when you talk about recognition, motivation, and culture. You know, how do you, how do you uh, bring people to the school and work with them to build the kind of culture where, where the things that you really want are important? So, and yes, Dr. Batista. Well, what I have particularly liked about the presentation today as I look at the diversity that exists uh, in and among all of the school organizations within NOLA PS, um, this can be a part that can really change the landscape of successful and quality schools for the children in the New Orleans public schools. I know that we do, as a board, we do a lot of oversight with um, providing services, not services, approving applications for schools to start up here, reviewing them, renewing them, extending them, and in often cases, sometimes denying those charters. But if we look at what's the glue that's going to help us make a quality school, it's going to be to get the people who are our, we're, our products. And I think this is one way of encapsulating how we can get them uh, to view this board as supportive of their academic endeavors. <clears throat> so I'm pleased that you had the foresight to and the stick to itiveness, uh, because I understand it's been a long, arduous trail that you you know you forged. But it's uh, it's certainly something that's worth the time and the effort that it has taken for us to get to this point. So I want to commend you. Yeah, let me, uh, I'm going to jump in here. So I, I think if I look at the, the Innovation and Stability, Stability Committee will, number two under there says, you know, well, the, the, it's number, number two. Uh, it says establish focus groups with school and community leaders. It sort of feels like this is, and, you know, I'd love the superintendent to tell me if this is right. It sounds like, like, a, uh, like a solution circle. Um, is what I is what I believe it to to be, uh, but you know I've, I've been hearing about the solution circles. I think it was brought up earlier by the assistant superintendent, uh, which I really appreciate. I like I think we like solution circles. Uh, you know I think those are good things. Yeah. So it's not quite a solution circle. The difference though is that with the solution circles, we come with the problem um, based on the feedback that we've gotten over the course of the ABC tours. So that would be the main difference, whereas the focus groups will be more exploratory um, and maybe they will result in a solution circle. Okay, listen. All right, listen. We, we might need a point two to that to get to the solution circle. The, the other thing that I'll just say, and I, I think I will agree with those who've 
probably stated that we should focus in on one to three things. Uh, and I know I know we probably differ here, Mr. Marshall, but I just want to say, uh, you know, the idea, like I, I, I take item in terms of potential focus group topics, expanding partnerships with community organizations. <clears throat> and, and I think I can also probably tie that together with the college scholarship mm -hmm. opportunity research program development. And, and I'll, I'll give an example here on, on what I mean by that, right? Um, we know that college track exists in, in this space. Uh, they are not known by every high school and every high school counselor, you know, doesn't have relationship with college track. They should, because that's an opportunity. Of, you know, there's a lot of opportunities there for monies, uh, and and so what can we do to make sure we put that type of organization in partnership with those high schools in a way that you know is is streamlined? And maybe the, the real question is, what can we do to make sure that organizations like those are put in front of schools in a thoughtful way? in streamlining the way, right? You know, I oftentimes also think about, you know, there, I think there's, th that is something that our schools don't need to spend time thinking about. They just need to go and experience them. And maybe we figure out organizationally how to rank those organizations um, and put them in different categories of, of interest and support. So then if you're a school and you say, well, we need to really, you know, ramp up our, opportunities around scholarships, you're like, well, let's go see what the district has in this area around this stuff. Um, you know, so I, I just say that there's opportunities here, but if we focus on all 10 of these things, I think it'll be difficult to, um, I think it'll be difficult for us as a committee to be, I think, dogmatic and clear and, and really get to a deep rooted answer on some of these things uh, over the course of our, you know, of our of our time together, and so like when I think about next year, I want to be able to say the committee worked on these issues this year. We have some answers. Some of we may not have answers on all things, but you know, I'd love to see us get to pointed things. Um, but it doesn't mean that we don't continue to take on and 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 house issues. But I just I personally would like to see us focus in on one of three items. Okay. I, I think it may be maybe more of an issue of just prioritization. Um, and I think if you take a look at the survey um, that is up here, um, you know, the questions are sort of what, what are your interests? You know, here are the focus groups that we've identified. What are you interested in? And it's possible that will bubble up through this engagement with the public is like, what is the priority? You know, we don't have to we don't have to just focus on a couple because we think they're the most interesting, you know, right? Maybe, maybe it's um, it's just a matter of prioritizing the list and getting started with what there seems to be some um, coalescence around. Just a thought. Yes, Ms. Ms. Seems yeah, and what I going. like most is the involvement and engagement of our students from the beginning. They're in at the floor up. Usually, it's driven down to them, so they're partners already and the engagement was extremely high with them and I just feel that that will be carried over as students take this back to their individual buildings and I see us developing a wonderful portrait of a graduate so thank you kudos to you right. and uh, of course the staff thank you yeah um, and actually uh, member Bodwin was uh, getting to what I was thinking as well, which is if we see, in a sense, a collective community effort, which is one thing I like most about it, as Ms. Kim was just talking about, like engaging the students themselves, for example, teachers, administrators, so forth, and we appreciate a bottom-up, then depending on our process, because to your point, at some point we've got to decide what we're going to put some attention to. Depending on our process, though, when do we begin to limit? And if maybe now we let things bubble up, we find out what is really the, uh, the idea, the, the, the broad uh, communication. Uh, I think sometimes uh, students and, and others can surprise us and set us in a different direction and wake us up. So if for now we are throwing a wide net, but understanding that at some point we do need to 
to get to, to a decision of what exactly we'll do. Um, and so I, I do think that we can do this, especially with survey results and so forth. But I, look, I had one question. Um, I found interesting, encourage, uh, organize, facilitate caregivers, community involvement. Um, what, do we have any uh, thoughts so far as to what that might look like? Number four, ISC will encourage, organize, and facilitate caregiver and community involvement to support students in schools. Like what we've been doing, or are there other things envisioned? Again, you know, this is not, this committee uh, was formed out of, out of a need for the board to have these kinds of conversations, right? Because the structure of our committees don't generally give us the opportunity to have these open public discussions about what's important, what do we want to do, how do we want to go about moving this district forward, right? And, I, and I'll say, say to, say to the, the board that our, we're, we're not limited by the seven of us. We're limited in our decision-making uh, authority to how we spend our money and how we direct our superintendent as to what is important. Right? So if you want to pick two or three things out of this to say we're going to fund those things or, or we're going to task the superintendent to, to accomplish those things, then that's how we limit ourselves as a, as a board. But if you take any one of these things and we can get somebody like the people from College Track to maybe chair that focus group on college scholarships, right, and then get some other people to join that have some expertise or some information that they, that they can contribute, uh, and let them research and develop an implementation plan for us, right? It's not that we're going, seven, are going to try to do all of these things because there's, there's no way. Student leadership development, right? Critical in, in giving them the skills necessary to lead their fellow classmates and have a real impact at, in the culture of the school, right? But again, it's not something that we will do as seven board members, but we will authorize a task force, a, a focus group, to actually develop a way in which we deliver on uh, student leadership development. That's, that's, that's the concept, not, not that we're going to try to do this as seven board members. We're gonna, we're gonna uh, excite, organize, and get the community to step up to the plate to begin to do some of these things that we aren't doing in our schools that we should be doing. Yeah, and thank you. And especially just to, to uh, you know, <coughs> elaborate with the ISC theory of change, the numbers two through four, I think said about a really important culture as to how we approach this, and I, and I, I like the way these are laid out. And the seeking of, of uh, government grant and philanthropic funding, that will be an important one too, in order to facilitate this work that we need to pay attention to and uh, see what uh, the committee can do in uh, making that successful. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, I just wanna follow up on a couple of comments I've heard. Um, uh, just first on, on role clarity, I wanna make, for anybody that is hearing this, and I know there are many who are hearing this and thinking, this is great, I would like to get involved. How do I get involved? Um, obviously, one is fill out the survey, uh, but this is, this is committee work. This is the work of Mr. Marshall and, and the ISC. Um, and so reach out to Mr. Marshall, reach out to myself, reach out to Mr. Ashley, reach out to Mr. Zervagon, those are the members of the committee, or reach out to any board member. We are happy to engage with you. Um, so that is one. The second is, and I think multi uh, many of us have touched on this, is the, to me, the power of this committee will be the power of the folks that we bring together to have these conversations. There are so many people in the city that approach us like, how can I help? I, you know, this is my area of expertise. What can I, I, had a, I had a Lyft driver last week ask me how he could get involved in helping schools. Um, so the, the energy is out there and it is the role of the committee to harness that energy and, and empower those individuals. Um, to, to do this good work. Uh, and the last thing I'll say is, I think there's a bit of a call to action for folks who do wanna get involved, who do wanna do this work. 
whether it is our schools and their students or uh, community members <clears throat> or um, fraternities, sororities, uh, links, all these organizations that are doing such good work. I want to make sure that they are connected to our schools and participate in the survey. I'm, I'm going to use an old, um, an old trick that I learned as a math teacher of a little friendly competition. I would love to see whether the women of Delta Sigma Theta Incorporated or uh, Alpha Kappa Alpha <laughs> complete the survey at a higher rate or the Alpha Phi Alphas or the Noops. Uh, if only there were some You got a noops. lot of deltas here. I just if want only, to acknowledge that if really quickly. If there were quickly. only some noops or deltas that could help us get this word out about this survey. Uh, just, you know, there's so many people that are working every day to help kids in the city, and hopefully this will serve as a way to bring those folks together uh, in, to the greater benefit of our city. <coughs> And one of the one of the first things we'll we'll start working on is how do we actually raise some funds to actually put some people to work full time to, to manage all of these this, these human resources we're going to get right? How do we manage all of this and keep it all functioning and focused in the right direction? So, yeah, now the work can begin. Yeah, I you know thank you. I think. I just want to make sure I, too, because I think we are thinking about this the right way. I, I will tell you, looking at the, the theory of change, the, the, the last two bullets make sense to me. The first one, I probably feel a little like, mm, we got to figure that one out, you know, in terms of help student, help schools. You know, what does that look like in terms of help schools? We know that there's autonomy in schools. We understand there's contracts and things like that. We just got to be very clear about what that looks like and feels like. You know, I think the but, – but I know I get the intent of what we're doing. And so, you know, I think I, my assumption is if we're able to, to show what we're doing well, then, like, there will be buy-in from the rest of the space in, in what we're doing. Uh, but in no shape or form are we, uh, you know, trying to be dictators about the thing, but really creating better, more innovative, more opportunities, more access so that folks, and do it for on their behalf, right, on behalf of, you know, so that there are, you know, less resources being used around this stuff. And then I think the other aspect of it is our administration, right? When we talk about grants and management and all this stuff, <laughs> You know, I think about Stewart. I think about, you know, what that's going to look like internally about making sure that our administration is able to do this work because they are tasked with doing the work in that way, um, not us in that way. Uh, meaning, you know, our committee exists for the, for like vision setting and creating and, and making sure that we're doing the right things, but like, you know, making sure that we, are thinking about ways that we're raising this money and then what does that look like for the administration is really important. So I know we're thinking about that. I think the first thing is being able to identify what it looks like uh, and, and actually do it and get a pilot going uh, around the work uh, to be able to showcase and get you know further buy-in from community in that way. Yes, Dr. Fulmore. If I could, because as people are listening to it, there's already some confusion happening because as Great. people look at this, they're not seeing the portrait of a graduate survey. And these are two very different things. And we haven't launched the portrait of a graduate survey for stakeholders. Um, the survey for students will be out, but this particular survey that our viewers may be hearing about will not include the portrait of a graduate information that you heard me presenting about. So as questions are coming in and they're not seeing that content, please know that the stakeholder survey for the portrait of a graduate will come out after Thanksgiving break. So as people are trying to respond and locate this particular survey, it is not the one that I reference in terms of the stakeholder one, so you will not see that one advertised at this time. Thank you, Dr. Fulmer. I'll, if I could, I'll just uh, extend that same challenge for the 
a portrait of a graduate survey as well when it uh, is sent out. And I know that you know people have a lot of thoughts on how to help this district, and I'm excited they have multiple opportunities to do that. Any more comments or questions or anything? <clears throat> I thank you, I thank my fellow board members for the participation, and uh, I look forward to to doing this work. Looking forward. Thank you very much. And I'd like to turn it back over to our President uh, Parker. Thank you so much, Mr. Marshall. We're now moving on to item 8.1, the 2023 board meeting calendar. Uh, it is recommended that the Orleans Parish School Board adopt the proposed board meeting calendar for the 2023 calendar year. May I have a motion to move item 8.1 to the full board? So. Yes, so moved. Uh, I've got a motion from Mr. Zervigan. Is there a second? Second. Second from Mr. Marshall. Uh, is there any public comment on this issue? Any board comment? All right, it's been moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? That will move to the full board. We are now moving on to our uh, legal and legislative committee, and so I will turn it over to Vice President Zervigan. All right, welcome to the last uh, committee of the day. Um, legal legislative. We have one item that was actually discussed earlier. Action item 9.1, Second Amendment to Charter Operating Agreement with Latham Schools, the Dolores Taylor Author School for Young Men. It is recommended that the Owens Parish School Board ratifies the request from licensed schools to add an eighth grade cohort as an amendment to its charter operating agreement. May I have a motion for, to move item 9.1 to the full board? Motion by Member Bodwin. Is there a second? Second. Second by Member Ashley. Any uh, public comment? Any board discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, it moves on to the board. And I will now pass it back to President Parker to move us into executive session. Okay, the time is now 3.54 p.m. May I have a motion to move us into executive session? So moved. It's been moved by Mr. Ashley. Second. Second. Seconded by Mr. Marshall. Uh, all those in favor, say aye. Aye. Let's see, the time is now 3.54 p.m. We will move into, ex in, into executive session.
All right, I'm calling back to order the November 15th, 2022 Orleans Parish Board Committee of the Whole. The time is now 4.46 p.m. May I have a roll call, please? Mr. Parker? Present. Mr. Zervagon? Present. Mr. Ashley? Present. Dr. Batiste? Ms. Bodwin? Ms. Eames? Here. Mr. Marshall? Here. Also present, Dr. Avis Williams, Superintendent, and Ms. Ashley Halpin, Board Council, you have a quorum. Wonderful, thank you so much, Ms. Brown. Uh, I'm now gonna yield to our Board Council to report on matters held in executive session. Thank you. Uh, during executive session, the Board held a discussion of an attorney-client privilege matter pursuant to Louisiana Revised Statute 42-17A10 and the Louisiana Code of Evidence Article 506. Um, Related to item 10.1, there is no recommended action. The board also held a discussion of uh, a lawsuit in DF, State of Louisiana Division of Administrative Law, docket number 2022-7761, DOE-IDEA, agency log number 23-H-11, administrative due process proceeding, and the board held a discussion of the lawsuit captioned Orleans Parish School Board versus Woodrow Wilson Construction LLC and Hanover Insurance Company, Civil District Court uh, for the Parish of Orleans, 2016-12346, construction litigation. Moving now to the action items. Um, action item 10.2. It is recommended that the Orleans Parish School Board ratify the settlement of this matter as recommended by its legal counsel. I have a motion to move item 10.2 to the full board. So moved. Second. It's been moved by Mr. Parker, seconded by Mr. Marshall. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, the motion. Uh, item 10.2 has been moved to the full board. Now item 10.3, it is recommended that the Orleans Parish School Board approve the revised mediation negotiation authority as recommended by its legal counsel. May I have a motion to move item 10.3 to the full board? So moved. Okay. It's been moved by President Parker, seconded by Mr. Zervagon. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, item 10.3 has been moved to the full board. Thank you, President Parker. All right, wonderful, thank you so much. We're now moving to item 11.1. .1. There are no further items on the agenda. May I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. It's been moved by Mr. Marshall, <laughs> seconded by Mr. Ashley, both of whom apparently have places to be. Uh, all, all those in favor say aye. aye. Uh, Any opposed? The time is now 4.49 p.m. This meeting is adjourned.